my colleagues, Councillor Janey and Councillor Flynn. I'd like to remind everyone that this is a public hearing and is being recorded and will be rebroadcast on Comcast 8, RCN 82, and Verizon 1964. It'll also be streamed online. I ask that you please silence your devices and cell phones. If you wish to publicly testify, please sign in at the front door. If you don't sign in, I will not be able to call on you for public testimony. Um, we have two panels this evening, um, this larger BPS sort of centric panel, and then following um, another panel, we'll take a break for two or three public testimony before we switch over to the next one. Um, this hearing is on docket 0199 regarding IEPs in the Boston Public Schools. It, I do want to clarify that this hearing is about individualized education plans, not independent education plans as it was a typo on one of our documents. I apologize for the mistake that I made in some of the language on our original hearing order. An individual education plan identifies the needs, goals, and services for a student. It is. Uh, often an intimidating and demanding process that students and families have to go through. There are approximately more than 11,000 students in the Boston Public Schools that have a disability and require specific services based on their needs, and BPS has an obligation to provide proper transportation, a school nurse, counseling, a plan for transition, and more. It is critical that we continue breaking down barriers for our students to achieve success, not create more. I often hear and feel that this, that the IEP process um, from start to finish and to eventual graduation can be very difficult for many of our students and families in BPS. We need to make sure that this service is accessible and assisting students while they're in our schools. Uh, my office and I, I continue to receive emails and phone calls regarding issues with IEPs and special ed in, in general and how it is negatively affecting our students' ability to learn and succeed. I've also unfortunately received calls this year of families who have left the Boston Public Schools because they felt they weren't getting the services that they uh, felt necessary for their children to achieve in BPS. Um, it, they also leave, unfortunately, at sometimes great expense to the district as well. We should be able to take care of and teach our kids here in Boston. I um, also want to note that this con conversation came up a number of times over the fall as I held meetings across the city regarding issues uh, regarding education uh, in our city. It was more or less the catalyst as well as some of the challenges that our families reached out to at the beginning of the year to, to have tonight's hearing. I look forward to hearing uh, from all of our panels. I look forward to, I think, a very what will be a, a thoughtful and thorough presentation from the Boston Public Schools and uh, hope that we can continue uh, working together to make sure that our kids receive um, services that they need and above and beyond um, what they need and get the services that they want. I thank my colleagues for being here and would like to offer them an opportunity to give an opening statement. Councilor Janey. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased for the opportunity uh, to be able to have this uh, very important discussion, um, not only as a Boston City Councilor, not only as the Vice Chair of Education, but as someone who cares deeply about this issue. Um, I want to first give a shout out to some former colleagues who are in the room. Uh, <laughs> Catherine and Janine are here. I worked with both of them uh, during my time at Mass Advocates for Children. As many folks know, Mass Advocates for Children is a child advocacy organization uh, with a special mission on making sure that all children throughout the Commonwealth get this, the, the education that they need. Um, and for students with disabilities, certainly uh, fighting to make sure that they uh, are getting the services that they need and that parents understand their rights under the law. So I'm grateful for the advocacy of MAC and the work that you continue to do. Um, I was particularly grateful um, to be able to turn to MAC uh, for my own needs uh, when my grandson uh, needed an IEP and to have the benefit of working for an organization that, that does amazing work, um, but also to have the benefit of advocates and attorneys uh, at my disposal. What I do understand, though, from that process is many parents don't have that same sort of resource. Um, I was fortunate that I worked there and I, I knew folks who were deep in the issue 
of special education, as well as my own advocacy around Boston Public Schools. But the majority of our parents, when we talk about 20% of our students, our young people uh, having IEPs, um, may not have the same sort of supports, uh, may not understand um, how the special education laws work, uh, what the policies are here in the district and may not have someone who is is fighting for them So it's important to make sure that any child uh, who has an IEP are getting the supports and the services that they need I know uh, from personal experience and from uh, what I hear from constituents that uh, that still is not the case uh, that there are, are, are many families who are have to fight uh, it's a long fight, it's a hard fight, and then they're still not getting the supports and services that their children need. And so that is uh, very problematic. Um, I'm also coming at this uh, through the lens of equity and making sure that um, all of our, our, our students with disabilities, but all of our young people uh, are being served well. Um, I know that there's a large population of students with disabilities who are also English language learners. I think if we peel back the onion, we'll see that there are large numbers that are students of color and making sure that, um, that, that their needs are being met. And my, my concern is that uh, for many students of color, particularly our black and brown boys, that their, their needs are not being met. Um, they are less likely to be in inclusive settings uh, with their peers and more likely to be in substantial separate programs, which is, is problematic. And so I, I wanna understand more um, what we're doing to address that concern. Um, and I, uh, I will save the rest of my comments uh, for when I ask questions. Just wanted to open up and, and thank you for your leadership and thank the panel for being here. Thank you, Councillor Janey. We've also been joined by Councillor Matt O'Malley. Councillor Flynn, opening statements. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, and thank you for your leadership on this important issue. And I just want to echo what Councillor Janey um, talked about is uh, making sure that our children, our students with special needs have access under, under the law, have access to every program that they're entitled to. And, you know, as we approach bud budget season on the Boston City Council, that's the job of the council is to advocate for those people and those children that desperately need our help. And that's what I int intend to do on the city council. I also come from this as, as a, as a, as a uncle, my sister's boy is special needs and he's having a difficult time, not in Boston, but um, I know the struggles of families um, with a child with special needs, the advocacy and the time commitment, but I also see the heroic wor work of a lot of families and I see a lot of heroic work of, of teachers doing, um, going above and beyond the call of duty really. And, advocating for children and students, those without, without a voice. And as, as Councillor Janey mentioned, I, I also represent a, a com communities of color. I, I represent the Chinatown community. And I was with a group of special education uh, parents last week talking about the programs um, available to those students. And they're also overcoming a a language barrier as well. They're also overcoming a, um, a, some other issues as well. So not only do we focus on the special education program, we also have to work on the family in making sure that there are services available to the families as well. And I'm just so proud of the, the teachers that work hard every day providing exceptional, exceptional care in teaching to our children, but also I think we can do more as, as a city, making sure that our special education program is the best that it possibly can be, and that's what I'm gonna do, um, advocating on, on behalf of, the, of these children during, during the budget process season. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Welcome, Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be with all of you, particularly uh, those in the audience and the parents. Looking forward to hear 
the story from family, so I will be brief. Uh, suffice it to say, I know we're all committed to doing everything we can to have as streamlined and effective a process for those students who require special education. Um, I know we have made some improvements in the IEP process, but there's still a lot of more improvements that can be taken, so I'm particularly looking forward to finding out ways that we can improve family engagement, uh, management of the IEPs, and a particular uh, focus not only on BPS, but also on private parochial schools that uh, students that we're serving uh, who aren't in the traditional BPS framework, uh, as well as efforts, and I know this is something the superintendent shares, we all share, to really limit the out-of-district placement um, of our students uh, for a whole host of reasons, not the least of which is we should need to be doing everything to make sure that BPS can uh, support uh, the whole child, uh, no matter what his or her uh, uh, circumstances may be. So looking forward to uh, this continued good work. Thank you for calling this. Thank you, Councilor O'Malley. So welcome again to all of you. I think we'll start with our Chief Academic Officer, uh, Dr. Charles Granson, for opening remarks and presentation. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, Chair Asabi George, uh, Vice Chair Janey, uh, and Councilors. Um, <clears throat> we uh, appreciate you having us here today to discuss some specific uh, areas related to um, uh, special education for our students. Uh, I am Charles Granson, Chief Academic Officer, um, uh, and in that role I oversee the Office of Academics Professional Learning, <coughs> Opportunity Gaps, uh, English Learners, um, Selwell, uh, which presented yesterday, and um, the Office of Special Education. In the Boston Public Schools, 21% of our 54,000 students have been identified as needing special education supports. We provide supports for these students in a variety of settings, including general education classrooms, inclusion classrooms, sub-separate classrooms, and private placements. What services we provide and what setting students receive uh, them in is determined through a team process that carefully considers the individual educational needs of students. Over the last few years, uh, under Cindy Nielsen's leadership, we have focused on uh, creating more inclusive opportunities and options for transition for our students. She has uh, created uh, inclusion support teams that provide direct support and coaching in classrooms where teachers uh, need additional training to support the behavioral and learning needs of their students. Uh, and in recognizing that all of our students need strong um, uh, foundational support, she has provided implementation of foundations uh, in lower grades uh, across the district. Um, she has moved our IEP system into 21st century with Easy IEP that consolidates students uh, and evaluation information and facilitates better communication with families. Uh, inclusion allows parents to receive a draft IEP at the end of their meeting. I should say, excuse me, easy IEP um, allows that. However, we still have work to do. We see persistent achievement and opportunity gaps for students with disabilities. To confront this, we have been assessing the state of curriculum in sub-separate classrooms, strategizing how to support the teaching and learning in sub-separate classrooms, uh, including uh, and providing culturally and linguistically sustaining practices, coaching, um, and uh, social emotional learning curriculum and support, and uh, many other educational strategies for uh, our, um, as was mentioned earlier, um, many of our students who are English learners and students with disabilities. Um, with that, um, I will turn it over to um, uh, Assistant Superintendent Cindy Nielsen um, and uh, Andrea Alves Thomas, Manager of Compliance. Good evening. Thank Chair. you. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Savi George, Vice Chair Janey, Councilors O'Malley and Flynn. Um, we like to start our presentations off with our special education vision statement. This is what we've been working under for the last four years, where we want for all of our students to have equitable opportunities to engage in innovative, high quality instruction in the least restrictive environment empowering each youth to achieve at high levels leading to post-secondary success. This is what drives the work that we were doing every single day in order to also continue to build inclusive practices across the system. Everything that we've uh, prioritized over the last four years and into the future falls into the buckets around identification and placement, so to the point of making sure that we're identifying the correct students for special education and that they're in the correct placements is a high priority. The second priority is the quality of instructional supports and services happening across all of our settings, from inclusion to our public days that we have within Boston Public Schools. Students, family, and community engagement, increasing our uh, visibility and our access to students, family, and the students, families, and the community as they are a hugely important partner, as we'll see later on in the 
presentation, they are, they are the main partner that we have within the IAP process. Equity and accountability or compliance where we are always um, assessed through uh, our ability to make sure things are on time and in compliance. And lastly, transition services. And we've been focusing on for a while with great advocacy from this council as well as FedPAC to increase the transition services that we have in BPS. Again, those are for our students that are 14 to 22 um, and making sure that students have access to the planning they need for post-secondary success. In the next slide, we have um, just a snapshot of the districts so that you have it in front of you. Um, this is our in school year 2018-19. We currently have um, about 12,015 students when the snapshot was taken of students with disabilities. Our ELs with disabilities are at 4,051. As Dr. Grandson shared, 21% of our of students of the district are students with disabilities. And then from there, one third of the 21% are students with disabilities that are also ELs. In addition, the graphs are showing you students with disabilities and ELs, students with disabilities by educational environment, going from full inclusion to out of district. So we thought we'd uh, start our framing of individualized education programs with where they come from, which is prescribed in law, both state and federal. Massachusetts has always been a progressive in education, and particular for students with disabilities, where in fact the IDEA is based largely on our Massachusetts special education law. Um, so we wanted to begin our framing there, and part of the highlight uh, that comes from both the IDA and our regulations is family involvement as a cornerstone of these uh, pieces of legislation. These are just some of the ways in which the IDA and our state regulations dictate how uh, parents are to be included in the IP process, and that includes requiring notification to parents of meetings in a timely manner, uh, requiring interpretation at meetings and translation of documents, um, making sure that parents are able to per participate by alternate methods if that's um, more appropriate for them. Also, consenting, obviously, to evaluation services. Um, communication should be simple and in commonly understood words. Uh, receiving progress reports as frequently as report cards. Having the right to observe programs. Um, and every district must have a parent advisory council. BPS continues to build ways to support families through working closely with the Boston Sped Pack and the Federation for Children with Special Needs. We also, we also have a dedicated parent liaison, and through that we've developed trainings for families as well as provided support to parents with substantive needs, that, as well as under, to understand and support the process, the IEP process. This next slide summarizes the process for special education, where we begin with a concern regarding a student um, who is then referred to the student support team, assuming this is a student coming up through uh, school-based concern, and we decide on appropriate uh, interventions based on that concern. As a department, we have been heavily emphasizing the need to provide appropriate supports and interventions prior to referring a student for evaluation to determine a disability and the need for special education. The reason for this is to ensure that the student is receiving quality instruction and supports in the general education classroom. We have also seen a slight reduction in referrals this school year as a result of this emphasis. If interventions are not successful and a disability is truly suspected, we move to the con consent phase where a parent is contacted by the special education coordinator. And um, again, in a school-based referral process, the evaluation is explained and families, uh, to families and consent for the evaluations that we are seeking. Once that consent is received, we have 30 school days to conduct the evaluations. At that point, we review the evaluation results and determine if a student is eligible for special education or related services. If so, an IEP is developed and a parent signs consent to begin services. I also want to clarify here at this stage as well that um, the presence of a disability doesn't always qualify for special education services, that this is what the process is actually determining is there might be a disability present, but that does, does not always lead to an I, IEP with services for the student. There has to be um, data that show that a student is not able to access the general education curriculum without modification. And those decisions about eligibility, accommodations, and services are made by an IEP team. And that is made up of the student's parents, uh, anyone the parent chooses to invite, a general education teacher, a special education teacher, representative of the district, which in Boston is um, our coordinators of special education, um, any others, and the student. 
our coordinators of special education, we have a few of us with us today, are school-based individuals who coordinate the IEP process. We have 105 total full-time employees who are school-based and supervised by principals with assistance from an assistant director in the special education department. They implement the district responsibilities around IEP development and implementation. They're also the parent's main point of contact for the entire special education process. A coordinator um, can, a student, excuse me, can have a minimum of two evaluations. Most students would have three, and some can have as many as eight evaluations, depending on their needs. The coordinator will make sure that staff know that consent has been given, remind them of when evaluations are due, when the meeting will be held, and other coordination, as well as assisting families. This slide highlights the school district's responsibilities regarding the IEP process we discussed, and it's just um, comparing and demonstrating where in the regulations these responsibilities come from. I won't go into them in, in too much detail. I already hit most of them with the exception of the last bullet, which is um, if an IEP has been, uh, sorry, excuse me, if a parent is dissatisfied with evaluations provided by Boston, we also have an obligation to offer independent education evaluations at no cost to parents. Um, IEPs are written for a 12-month period, and they begin based upon when the meeting is held. Meetings are held throughout the school year. A parent's or a family's responsibilities are um, meant to be lighter. Um, a consent, obviously, for the evaluation to begin is of utmost important, uh, importance. Um, they would attend the team meeting, um, providing remote options, interpretation as, provide, as needed. They would consent for the IEP if one is developed, and any medical documentation is optional for the family. It is not a requirement to have at an IEP meeting, um, and we can facilitate that process as well. Discussing what happens at an IEP meeting, um, considering these topics, there is no doubt that meetings are tense and can be stressful when you are reviewing your child's evaluation results and focusing on areas of weakness and whether or not they constitute a disability. We aim to focus staff during trainings on reminders about this tension and have them attempt to support parents in their understanding of the jargon that is sometimes used, being meaningful in their presentation, and not just reading a report and being engaged team members when discussing all parts of required IEP meetings. Those parts include listening actively to a parent's concerns, reviewing the data that was collected through interventions prior to referral, classwork, state assessments, reviewing evaluation of the, uh, the, data, the evaluation data that was obtained through those evaluations. Then determining whether or not the student is eligible for special education, determining what, if any, services are necessary, accommodations, goals, and finally, if placement is necessary for a student focusing on the least restrictive environment. We support the IEP process with a heavy, uh, a concentration on heavy training for coordinators. They participate in 65 hours of mandatory professional development each year as compared to a teacher with required 18 hours per year. Professional development also always emphasizes facilitating family understanding of disability and the special education process. Topics have included understanding each disability category as outlined by the Massachusetts regulations, conducting efficient and appropriate meetings, culturally and linguistically sustaining practices, and of course, ed plan, which is our IEP management system training. In, oops, sorry. IEP management. Uh, in fiscal year 16, the count, uh, Executive Council uh, approved a budget investment for Boston in an I, a new IEP management system moving away from our BPS homegrown system. We completed the procurement process in March of 2017 and migrated data over the summer of 2017. The new system called EdPlan manages both IEPs and uh, 504 plans and went live at the start of the school year in September 2017. A parent portal, which we will discuss further, went live in June 2018. The system has allowed us to pull more accurate data and maintain more records electronically. Some of the benefits for family is that the IEP is uh, easier to read and can contain more information in students' strengths and key evaluation summary sections so that a person reading the IEP has more information about the student. The system manages uploaded evaluations by school staff and any parent may present. It has the electronic portal for parent viewing of student documents, but more importantly, electronic signature of both IEPs and 504 and other documents soon to come, including consents. 
These same benefits um, apply to staff. In addition, there's an at-a-glance feature that provides a summary of the IEP when the entire document is not needed for a staff member to, to see. Um, the online access um, hopefully allows for less follow-up by staff on signatures. Um, at times, it can take up to two months to obtain parent signature. And so with that timely receipt of signature, services can begin. And finally, staff can run some of the reports for themselves, which is helpful to understand the needs of students at schools. Speaking of that data benefit, um, the next slide shows some of the data we have obtained from the system here. To date, 77% of IEPs presented have been signed, and 57% of enrolled students um, IEPs have been presented, completed between September and March. Typically, we have a high volume of IEPs coming due in June and May, in part due to the spike in referrals that we'll discuss on the next slide that is consistently happening in March of the school year. Speaking of that, um, referrals for initial evaluations. In this year, to date, we have 2,065 students referred for initial evaluations. The current eligibility rate um, is 74%. So 74% of those students were found eligible for special education. And as you can see, there is consistently a spark, spike in March year over year. Um, the number of those is 411, 379, and 316 respectively for each of those school years, 16 through current. Um, and here are special education classrooms currently in BPS. There are a total of 930 classrooms, excluding classrooms at the McKinley, Carter, and Horace Mann School for the Deaf. We endeavor to help expand high quality practices in classrooms while also welcoming feedback to continue to improve the quality of programming across all settings. As a core of our department's work is to support, celebrate, and increase opportunities for students with disabilities, a protected class. We're also interested in diversity such as race and gender. Overall, and is consistent with the field of education, the majority of our staff are female. We work toward and look to see an increase in males on staff. In addition, 40% of our staff are people of color, and a priority for the department is to increase this number to more closely reflect the students and families in the city. Diane. Now I'll turn it over to Diane Campbell from our Strive Department. Uh, good evening, thank you for having me. My name is Diane Campbell, I work in the Strive office, uh, which is a, a team of uh, teachers that are on assignment throughout the city to work with students age 14 to 22 as they transition from their middle of high school and into post-secondary education. So the first slide, um, th this is a, a list of some of the partners with whom we work over the last few years. Uh, under Ms. Nielsen's leadership, we've been able to increase the number of um, partners with whom we collaborate. Um, we work with the Goodwill Industries, Work Inc., Triangle, Best Buddies, Special Olympics, and so on. What we are trying to do is provide students with internship and work opportunities so that they'll have some in-school training so when they transition to an adult program, they will have some skills to increase their employability. So the STRIVE team, um, we provide transition consultation to schools, so we work directly with high schools and middle schools. We go into the buildings, we're each assigned a, a, a cohort of buildings. We go in, we work directly with teachers, with um, COSIS people to help um, assist them with any questions or concerns regarding students' transition services, and um, we also do some direct service with the students as well. Um, we collaborate with the, the vendors, um, make sure all the transportation, things like those things are in place for when the kids are going out to their work sites. We provide work opportunities at a variety of different locations throughout the city. We employ approximately 500 students a year and approximately 160 during the summertime with the assistance of the uh, mayor's uh, summer job program. <coughs> And we try to assist the schools in incorporating students into their IEP process. We like to um, assist them and training them how to have a student participate in their own IEP. Approximately at the age of 14, we like to invite the students to their own meeting, um, have them invite other 
participants with whom they feel comfortable, um, provide the teachers or suggest a certain template of, uh, so that the students can present information of their successes over the school year, uh, review the student's personal vision, and then to come up with some, use that personal vision to establish goals for the coming year. Um, during the IEP process, every student is required to have a transition planning form completed, and this is a, a form that is, uh, will touch on the instructional, the employment, and the community experiences that will assist the student in reaching their vision. And then we utilize this transition planning form, and it will inform the development of goals for the IEP. Thank you very much. Is that it for the presentation at the end there? Um, I do want to note, I, I uh, missed my opportunity during opening statements to note that today is World Autism Day. Although it's World Autism Awareness Month, today is a very special day and I just want to note it. You'll see many of uh, the presenters as well as guests in the audience wearing their pin. And now I wish I got mine sitting in the car. I wish I brought mine up. Um, I also want to note that this afternoon I was able to participate in the Strive program's 30th uh, anniversary celebration with Wentworth Institute of Technology, and it was just a very special afternoon, uh, recognizing some um, former students who now have been employees at Wentworth. Um, one was 30 years, one was 29 years, and I think somebody else is 26 years, so it was just really special to be there and to participate in that. Um, so my questions to this presentation, again, thank you all um, for a very thoughtful and um, I think detailed presentation. I am curious about if you could just explain uh, the differences between the 14 to 22 year old population and then the 18 to 22 population, what their sort of their needs might be and how they differ, differ in the services that the district provides them. Oh, I uh, anything, please feel free to. So the population for 14 to 17 are usually students that might more often be uh, maybe college bound or post-secondary school bound. Um, so their transition services would center more around um, maybe college applications or work, um, work after school work experience more than it would be the need for high level of hands-on training during the work experience. Um, and so th those services and the transition services around her 14 to 17 year olds were definitely working on and have been for the last few years to increase for students to have more opportunities for transition services at that age level. Our students that are 18 to 22, and again, Diane can speak very uh, well to this. This has been what she's been doing for, the other strive has been doing for a very long time. The 18 to 22 year old students usually have a higher level of need and a more severe disability. Their transition services would usually center around more around adult living skills as well as um, on the job training, vocational skills, and moving people as close or as far, as far along as they possibly can to independent living is what is usually focused on 18 to 22. So the 14 to 18 year olds in the middle schools and the beginning of high school, we try to focus on the students developing their vision, uh, working with the teachers in collaboration to bring some transition curriculum into the schools. As they get uh, through like the beginning of high school and working their way through, we try to provide them with in-school vocational opportunities. So they will set up a number of different um, work opportunities within the building to kind of get them started, get them used to uh, participating in a work program, you know, signing a timesheet, making sure they have the stamina for work. And then as they progress, we like to move them out into the community with the supervision of a teacher. And then from there, the next step would be to move them into competitive employment or into a service with an adult service provider. And how many students do we have in that 18 to 22 year old range right currently in Bosque schools? The s students with significant needs would probably be close to 500. And how many, um, how many people do we have like you, Diane, or your counterparts that work with that 500 population? So there are five community connection facilitators with it that work with the high schools, and then we also have three community field coordinators, one running um, a disc center over at English, two of whom are at the Wentworth campus, and then Brenda is also a CCF at the Wentworth campus. So it's eight or nine? Uh, let's see, five. Yeah. Eight, we recognize eight. nine teachers today yeah. through the STRIVE program, so those that's, not, that's, that's the that's group the there. Yes. So those nine, um, those nine teacher facilitators, coordinators, those nine people 
are um, responsible for working with those 500 youth, the 18 to 20 year olds? Correct, and also consulting with the middle schools as well. The 14 to 18. So that seems like a, disp that seems like a lot of kids per adult, um, especially thinking about some of the intense support services, especially with that 18 to 22 year olds, and if they're also supporting the 14 plus kids, what, what are the main functions of those nine um, teachers? Um, what we do is we provide consultation to the teachers, so we've been doing a lot of training of the teachers to bring them into the process so that the high schools are owning the responsibility for the students under their care. Um, we we're also doing some work with individual students as far as job development and those kinds of things. We're working on referral process, assisting the families and doing referrals to adult service providers, whether it be the Department of Developmental Services or Mass Rehab, and as well as the others. Um, beyond that, we often assist parents with guardianship process, um, social security issues, things like things of that nature. Seems like a lot for nine teachers. Um, back to the presentation, I sort of made notes as we went along. On page four, there it's the students with disabilities, it's the graph um, identifying out of district, public day, substantially separate. Can you just tell us what each of those mean, out of district, public day? Sure. Uh, the public day schools are account for our students that are still within uh, Boston Public Schools. They're students that are attending the McKinley School, Horace Mann uh, School for the Deaf, and the Carter School. And when, it's, when it says out of district, that means that they are out of district. They're not in Boston, Boston Public Schools. They're not in Boston anymore. Public yes. Schools. And that's substantially separate? Substantially separate are our settings where students are um, outside of the general education classroom for 60% or more of the day. And they might be at English High School yes, or they're, yep, some that's of the, the other Those are sometimes nice. referred to strand programs. Okay. Those are the point, uh, substantially separate. And then the partial inclusion students are most often what we would, uh, are resource services. So they're in the uh, classroom up to 20, 80%? 20. 20, yeah, 20 so six, part of the day, they're yeah, part the general, of the day, yeah. general ed, part yes. of the day in a substantially separate or resource room. Uh, resource. Part of the day resource room, room. and general ed general is a split. Ed. And then full inclusion would be that they're not out of the general education classroom for more than 20% of the day. And for our older kids, what schools does that include? For full inclusion? Yep. Um, is it the Henderson? The Henderson K-12, yes. The Mary Lyon? The Mary Lyon, the Burke. The Burke. Um, I can get you a f more full list. I don't want to misspeak on the list, but we can get you a more Great. full list of where the full inclusion is. Great. It would be sort of nice to see where our kids are landing. Yes. And I imagine a lot of these students um, for the full inclusion, or, or I guess all of these categories, were mm -hmm. also at the West Roxbury Academy mm -hmm. and um, Urban Science Academy? Yes, there were programs that were there that we've been working very closely with the, family, with the families to make sure that they understand what the transition means. If they um, to if they want, we're scheduling right now visits to the school so the families and students can visit the school over the course of the spring to transition um, to where they're going next, so Great. yes. Thank you, and that's the end of my time. Uh, Councilor Jeannie. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, uh, and thanks again to the panel. I wanna follow up on some of the questions around the 18 to 22 year olds. Um, how many students were we talking about? Is that for you? The 500 the 500, students. 500, yes. 500, and it's the nine teachers? Is that what I'm understanding yes, yep. from your questioning? So, so can, yeah, can I, I just wanted to clarify two things. Um, so there's six of teacher, certified teachers that are doing this programming and there's three community field coordinators or CFCs. So I just wanna make sure that that's clear. Oh, so, so six, six teachers. Six teachers and three, yes. So six teachers mm -hmm. for 500 students, now so, how does that work? So yep, I wanna explain that a little bit more actually. So um, the model is that we're moving for, away from the uh, strive people doing all the direct services to the students and then also, but also to the point that Diane made about training the, the schools as transition services aren't something Can that you land, slow down please? Sorry, they're not something that land into the school, they have to be throughout the day. So the training is happening so that um, teachers are taking more ownership as Diane referred in the schools to be doing transition services all day long rather than having someone come in to do what referral or what uh, that piece of it. So I'm well. still, uh, you know, have questions and concerns about the sheer number of students versus teachers and mm -hmm. whether or not they're getting everything that our students in BPS would be getting or not, I don't know. So, um, and I'm happy to follow up. I don't want to use all five of my, is it five minutes? 
Madam for the Chair. first round. All right. Um, so I'd love to kind of come back to, to understand Absolutely. more. And then the reason I ask is mm -hmm. because, and you know, perhaps this is a wonderful program, love the opportunity to come see it, but um, you know, the, the feedback that we get from constituents mm -hmm. who call and, and certainly from people in the advocacy community who are in this, they're using, you know, phrases like warehousing our students. And when you have such large numbers of young people who may not have gotten what they need through BPS, coming you know up through K through 12 and now we've got you know just six teachers and three so I just want to be really clear those are six centrally funded people all these 18 to 22 years are also assigned to classrooms and schools okay good. so they also have full programs at the school level that they're attending every day and the expertise of the transition specialists are coming in to work on the specific transition opportunities that like the partners and the vendors and attached and wonderful and people I want to um, shift gears um, so another thing that we hear about are the number of students who go to a charter school maybe from BPS but then end up back in BPS. Uh, we hear about the timing of those students coming in, usually around testing time. Um, one thing that I'm concerned about is that we, those students are not getting their services. If they are students with disabilities, are not getting their services right away, that they're kind of in this holding pattern. What, what is that? Is that, uh, I mean, they, they have an IEP, they're known to the district having had an IEP when they were here before, they go to a charter school, no surprise, it, it doesn't work out, they come back. How do we get them uh, the services that they need uh, in a seamless way where there's not an interruption? So, when so are you aware of this problem, number one? And then so, two, how do we address um, it? That there is an interruption service, I'm not, I would love to follow up more and learn about that because the uh, system that we have right now generally Families are coming with the IEPs in hand when they re-register back in BPS, or if we do see that there's been an IEP within the last two years, we'll revert to that IEP and ask the parent if they want to use that piece of that if and they then don't what have the paperwork. And they get assigned to schools based on the level of need they have. So if they're a student with resource level need or partial inclusion, as we talked about, they would go through the um, Welcome Center for enrollment, they choose that way. And if their IEP comes with uh, substantially separate services that are needed, then we uh, we work with them on the schools that have those programs available. So if, stu if, if, if parents are calling our offices saying that they're not getting the services that they need right away, do I refer them back to you? Like what, yes. what so, because that, what I'm hearing is that there's this interruption, that they're not getting the services right away, that there's this break. Okay. That's, that's happening. Shouldn't be happening, and okay. that's not our intent. I want to come back to slide four. Mm -hmm. uh, I see the chair checking the no. clock. <laughs> so on slide four, um, and thank you for the definitions for the legend there. This is uh, the slide that has the breakdown of the students with disabilities mm -hmm. in the district. And um, I can see the breakdown based on program <coughs> type. Uh, what I'm interested in, in, in you breaking this down by race, gender, language mm -hmm. of the students. So let's just look at uh, the fifth, the, the uh, full inclusion. If we look at the blue bars, um, and, and it's important to note, while we have full inclusion uh, classrooms available, it's important to make sure that we're doing inclusion right, mm -hmm. that we are not dumping children into general education without the supports. And I would argue that they need uh, a full-time general ed and a full-time special ed teacher in the classroom and not just, not just you know, paraprofessionals who, or, or a teacher who has three certifications. So we've gotta make sure that they are getting the actual supports that they need. So that's number one. Um, and I, I know we're, we're not there because we're asking teachers to get multiple certifications rather than uh, having the two uh, teachers. But let's, let's look at that bar, the, the, the blue bar that says full inclusion. If we break that student population down, and I'd like it for all of them, mm -hmm. what are we looking at in terms of race, gender, and ethnicity? So we Language. definitely have this slide, and I can get this to you um, shortly after this. We, don't, we didn't include this um, in this presentation, but I can get this to you very yeah. shortly after. So, I will, so I've said this before uh, in my capacity as an advocate before joining the city council, and I will say it again here, for everything, if we are serious about closing the opportunity and achievement gap, we need to have this information clearly marked down for everything. Mm -hmm. So what anecdotally I know is that, uh, that the sub-separate children are more likely to be black and brown, and 
full inclusion children may not be. And so I think it's important to have that in front of us at all times to make sure that we're doing everything to ensure that all children have the least restrictive settings and have access to full inclusion, real full inclusion with the actual supports and, and staffing that we need to make sure that it's, that it's done right. So I am very much interested in understanding for each of these program areas what the breakdown is by race, by gender mm -hmm. and by ethnicity. Yes. And Thank if you. I could add language. You and language, I did language mention language, language and language. Mm -hmm. And language is very important as well. And we already know that a third of the students with disabilities speak a language mm -hmm. other than English at home. So just important to understand which language groups we're talking about and how um, they're being supported. I will save the rest of my comments and questions for the next round. Mm -hmm. um, I see my colleague waiting patiently. Thank so, you, Councilor Janey. Thank you. Councilor O'Malley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't know the slide number, but I want to go back to the slide that says IEP process data. Uh, it was towards the end of the presentation. Well, we're coming up on that. So um, this re it reads, for those who may not have a copy of it, 6,821 IEPs have been written between September 2018 and March of 2019, accounting for 57 percent of currently enrolled students with disabilities. Uh, so that means 43 percent haven't been uh, haven't been written? Correct. So what's, is the, are we, is this typical where we are in the process? Is it ahead? Is it behind? Yes. Yes, and especially if you look at our referral slide, because yeah. so many referrals happen in March, April, May, June, those meetings tend to come up annually at the same time. So 43% of our meetings are held in the latter half of the school year. Okay. So is every student uh, that has applied or, has pa or their parents have applied for an IEP going to have a plan written this school year? Yes, so there are a number of meetings that may not happen for various reasons. Um, there is a, I as manager in compliance meet regularly with the assistant directors as well as coordinators directly to find out you know, the status of their compliance and what's going on with their students, making sure that they are receiving their services and their IEPs in a timely manner. At times, um, we have found there are certain buckets of, of issues that come up for students um, that result in delays. Some of them may be illnesses, uh, homelessness, caregiver changes, um, a variety of sure, issues. And understood. then we have about 10% with some staffing concerns that we're addressing as well. Um, but we are ensuring Just that- Expound on that a bit, t staffing concerns. Sure, a some folks um, who either have gone out on leave and were catching up a little bit to, to get to where they were. Um, some folks who were behind and were working to help them catch up. Um, so okay. through no fault of the family sure. or the student. I understood. And 77% of IEPs that have been reviewed, so 77% of those 6,821 um, have been signed and accepted by the families. Correct. What are, briefly, what are some of the reasons why they haven't been signed or accepted by the families? Um, we did a data analysis and sometimes it takes about two months just to get that to a family. We make multiple attempts and now we have a parent portal to enable okay. that to be a little bit easier. Um, there, we have staff who go door to door, honestly, to get signatures and try to catch a parent when they're coming in for a meeting or a parent teacher conference, but sometimes it just isn't signed. Okay. To, yeah. And does that 6821 figure, is that specifically Boston Public School students or does that include uh, Boston, Public, Boston residents who are in private or parochial? It, include, or? it includes all students. All so students. Boston residents, yeah. Walk us very briefly, because uh, I really appreciate the chairs keeping us to a, a, a brief time period because I want to hear more from parents, but walk us briefly through the process if I have a, a child who's at a Catholic school because didn't receive a, a placement that I wanted, but uh, requires some special uh, services. How do I apply for that as a parent, and what does it look like, you know, from a process point sure. of view? Um, the parent would come to a welcome center and say, I'd like to have my student evaluated for special education. We would assign them a student ID number, assign them to a school for evaluation, contact that school and let them know that the student has been enrolled for this purpose, um, and then that school would send out a consent. This year also we consented, we conducted five, uh, four f child find screenings for children 6 to 21 who are exclusively in private and parochial schools. Um, we sent out notice for that so that they could come to a screening if they had a concern relating to a disability, they would be screened on site, receive a consent on site, and the process would then again be assigned to a school for the evaluation and, I and team meeting process. Um, Can you furnish us the breakdown of kids in BPS and outside uh, within the city who 
I can uh, get that to you. And, and also what the percentages that have completed uh, IEPs. My time is nearly up, but I want to ask Carolyn Kane, someone who I think has done incredible work uh, for all students for many, many years, certainly my time on this body. Um, has the process gotten better in your time as both a parent, as an advocate, as attorney, um, and Ms. Lashinsis as well, feel free to jump in here. Just what, from, from SPEDPAC, how, how are we doing? What could we be we doing better? Well, first of all, thank you, Council O'Malley, for the very kind words, and thank you, um, Chairperson Asabi George and Ch Vice Chairperson Kim Janey for the opportunity to be here this evening. Um, I should introduce myself because some people don't know who I am. My name is Carolyn Kane. I am first and foremost the mother of a 19-year-old with significant disabilities in the Boston Public Schools. I have uh, had the pleasure and honor and sometimes the doom of being the Boston SPEDPAC Chair, which is a volunteer position for the last 10 years. Um, during that time frame, I have uh, worked with four du different superintendents and four different special education directors. I will tell you that in doing some um, house cleaning this weekend, spring is here, I came across some documents dated 2013. And I will tell you that it was um, very enlightening in looking at those documents because things that we were asking the district for in 2013 are the same things that we're asking the district for in 2019. The reason I say that is that special education students and I'm sure ELL has similar concerns, have not been given the priority that they need to be given in BPS. And without appropriate funding, that will always be the case. So this is not a special education issue. This is a district issue. Has the process gotten better? Yes, it has. We got rid of an antiquated and um, very difficult SIM system that I begged the district for years to cut off the gangrene and get rid of it because it was antiquated before it was even implemented, similar to some of the um, technology that's in the uh, big dig. Anyway, um, with regard to the IEP process itself, we have a new IEP system in place. And I will also say that, you know, in sitting here and working with so many different people across the 10 years, including the school committees, is that um, this special education office has been the most collaborative and the most responsive to us as SPEDPAC. Nobody's perfect, we have a lot more work to do, but what I've seen is for Cindy Nelson to grow a cohesive team that is responsive to parents. The issue about transition services, that is the only investment during the entire time I have been SPEDPAC chair, again, 10 years, of $1 million for 4,500 students, which is about $222 per student. Now, to expect the district to be able to provide things like travel training, pre-employment skills, employment opportunities, community experiences, and daily living skills from more significantly impacted students, that is just not possible. So what we're trying to do each year is do more with less. And the number of students with special needs is not going down. We have children leaving for charter schools, private schools, exam schools, schools that have specific entrance requirements that are beyond the reach of students with special needs. And each year, we have been asked to cut something from the special education budget. The district's budget is around $1.2 billion. Special education gets about $100 million. We are 20% of the population in BPS and we don't get 20% of the district's budget. So again, this is not a special education issue. It's a district issue. It's one about the district itself owning responsibility for all students in BPS, for all of the adults working from the school principals to the teachers to the therapists, recognizing that the SPED students are not the responsibility of the special education teachers, the BCBAs, the ABAs, the related service providers. They are the responsibility of everyone in BPS. So unless and until that gets recognized, I will continue to look back at my 2013 presentation about what's needed in special education and continue to hope it occurs and somewhat before my daughter ages out in the next two years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you for your incredible advocacy and uh, you, you inspire us all, uh, all, both of you and your, everyone in SPEDPAC. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor O'Malley. And if we were to turn in our packet two pages um, past, 
there is a the, the grid on the special ed classrooms and the number of classes that are currently in place for students uh, requiring special accom certain accommodations and it's 930 classrooms and it's broken down can we talk a little bit about the need of our kids and well, I'm setting my own timer I've got to be true to my own timer here um, is this fulfilling the need of our kids the needs of our kids so I uh, think that looking at where we are, we have increased our number of inclusion classrooms a bit over the last five years, which um, has been helpful to make sure that we have students that are getting educated within the general education classroom or the least restrictive environment first. Um, as we look at our substantially separate classrooms, they also do still continue to grow. One area to look at is ABA-based classrooms. That number still t continues to get higher. Uh, about five years ago when we're doing, we're starting to project for five years so into about 2014, projecting to now, um, there was more of an expectation in the population to have leveled off with autism, of, of people with autism, or students with autism that were coming through starting at age three. That actually has not leveled off, that continues to increase um, with more diagnoses as well as, I believe that the Omnibus Act has helped us well with that, um, where a diagnosis of autism is required for services uh, to wrap around the family. So I think there are a lot more diagnoses that are coming out. To that end, we have had to increase our number of ABA-based classrooms, which are, are, are substantially separate classrooms that um, teach our students with a teacher, two paras, and a max of 10 kids. Um, and I do believe that this, this, these classrooms coupled with the uh, three programs that we have, the Horace Mann, the McKinley, and the Carter, do um, offer the spectrum of services and settings that we do need in the district. What I do believe that we still have a, uh, work to do, and we are, uh, doing this as an asset team as well is looking at the quality of instruction happening in those classrooms. So I do think that we do have the settings available. It's making sure that we are holding ourselves to really high levels of expectation around rigor and curriculum in those classrooms. Well, I think uh, Councillor Janey's comment earlier about the inclusion challenges is mm -hmm. a very real one. And mm -hmm. as we increase the number of inclusion seats, but we're not increasing the number of professionals in those buildings, that's you know, that's going to continue to be a problem. You're going to see that reflected in the quality and the access to quality that our kids aren't experiencing. Um, one thing that we have heard is students who have required certain um, classroom settings mm -hmm. in their IEP, but there aren't enough seats mm -hmm. for those students. So can we talk a little bit about how long kids are waiting to get into mm -hmm. a certain seat? If they, if a seat isn't available, what's that timeline? Mm -hmm. And you know how how are we in compliance if we have kids that are assigned or in their IEP, it has a certain uh, prescription for services, but we're not able to meet it. What mm -hmm. happens? How big is that problem, and what happens when that problem arises? So the problem does happen on a case-by-case -case basis. It also does happen more often this time of the year, when at the beginning of the school year, we have classrooms that are opened that aren't full yet, because of the nature of how special works. Obviously, kids are going in and out of classrooms or settings based on their IEP team that determines. Um, if there is a delay in moving a student to a different setting that might be more restrictive, we do, um, if the IEP is signed and accepted by the family, the program, so there's two different signatures we're looking for. If the IEP is signed and accepted or whatever is accepted on that IEP, we are trying to implement as much as possible. In some cases, that might be having to add extra staff places in order to cover the, the services that, was, that were then agreed to in that IEP that would maybe trigger a change in setting. Um, and then if the, once the setting becomes available, we're moving them as well. This time of year also, I just want to um, note that we do try to find that follow the general education process as well. We're trying not to move kids this late in the school year um, to other schools. That is a conversation we have individual case-by-case case families that if we are able to put the services into place to the end of the school year and they, the student and the family feel like they can finish out the year in the same placement, we'll do that and then move them for September because it's more of a natural transition. But that, that's the conversation we have. I think um, I hear that you're alluding to segmenting, which is something that we do, that is part of the process that um, happens. And that needs to happen with a parent's permission. Yes. And are we ever out of, out of compliance with that, where parents aren't agreeing to those terms? that a parent would say they, they want their a child A parent to wants the child to receive the services that are in their IEP. Right, if it's the movement, we, f we figure something out if they're rejecting the, the, the plate, like, yeah. I don't wanna say never because we uh, have been out of compliance in times, but if a parent doesn't agree to it, we're not gonna keep them for the rest of the year in one place if they're not Right, but if there it. isn't room in the other placement, the, so what do we do? In some of the other placements, sometimes other children are moving because the, the placement, uh, 
the placement process in the special education office happens very, very quickly. Every day, like one day C might not be there, the next day there might be three that open up. In addition, there are times that we work with schools, uh, principals and individual classrooms to see if we can add an extra, uh, an extra support or paraprofessional or someone to the classroom to also mediate the fact that they might need, they might have an extra child in there. Okay, because I think that it's important, especially as we as a council mm -hmm. think ahead to the budget process that mm -hmm. we're about to embark on, that we have um, the appropriate balance of seats mm -hmm. to meet the need of our children. Mm -hmm. And if we aren't able to meet the need mm -hmm. of our children, adjusting um, staffing levels and adding classrooms or shifting classrooms to meet the needs of those kids. Because we talk a lot about compliance, mm -hmm. and if we aren't able to fulfill an IEP, then we're out of compliance. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a significant problem, mm -hmm. not just a, a moral and ethical right. problem, but that's a legal problem mm -hmm. for us as a city and as a school department. Yes. Carolyn? I was just going to add to that that... Um... Go ahead, I'll come on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that this was a bigger issue for the district years ago, where the, many children, I think the majority of children, come into special education from early intervention. Okay, so they're coming in when they turn three years of age, early intervention ends, and their IEP is supposed to be in place at the time that they turn three. Because of the district's previous assignment process, right, they weren't saving seats for children coming in throughout the year through special education, you know, being deemed eligible for special education. The district has been doing a much better job of that. We're working with early intervention, looking at the number of kids coming in, and then opening additional classrooms so that doesn't happen. So that was more of an issue in the past than it is currently. Obviously, um, children do get um, deemed eligible in the later years, but more so it happens at the early ages and making sure that we have seats in those early childhood um, classrooms, especially in inclusion classrooms, because children learn through play at ages three and four, um, is something that we've been doing a better job at, but we need to continue to improve by making sure that um, special edu education students are accounted for when classrooms are being opened throughout the year. A lot of times in the past, because there were no spots left in the um, early education classrooms, that's how we ended up with so many kids in substantially separate settings. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Jane. Yes. You know hello, hello. On. Yes, slowly, but I'd like to wait until it actually comes on so you can hear me. Um, and thank you for that, Carolyn. I think that's very important to, to know and understand the progress that the district has made. Um, and, you know, progress does not come without struggle. As I'm sure you know, Mass Advocates for Children sued the district around this issue um, of early uh, uh, education intervention for children. So glad that they're making progress there. I kind of want to just follow up on some of the my earlier questions and some of the questions um, that um, the chair was asking around ABA services. So one of the things that I'm hearing uh, is that parents agree to it, it's in the IEP, and yet um, these services are not being provided for, for at least a number of parents who are reaching out to advocates mm -hmm. in the advocacy community. Um, and so I'm hoping that you can shed some light on, someone can shed some light on what is happening. Um, so my daughter, first of all, gets ABA services in the Boston Public Schools, and I will say they have been of the highest quality that um, I've ever seen, and I've worked with hundreds of families. So kudos to BPS and their ABA team, particularly my daughter's ABA. But with regard to ABA, um, being the Executive Director of the Autism Commission for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I can tell you that we have major workforce issues, particularly in the area of BCBAs and ABAs. What happened was in 2010, the Eureka law passed, which made commercial insurers responsible for medically necessary treatment for individuals with autism. So that meant that if you had Blue Cross or you had Tufts or you had someone else, you can get a treatment plan approved by your insurer, and then you have to get somebody to be able to provide those services. In addition to that, in 2014, the Commonwealth passed the Autism Omnibus Law, which made Mass Health equally responsible for children up to the age of 21 to provide medically necessary treatment, including ABA services. So because of those two laws what, and the increase in individuals being diagnosed with autism, currently it's, you know, it's one in 59, 
much higher, four times more likely in boys than girls, is there aren't enough people to go around. So private providers are struggling, insurance companies are struggling, and school districts across the state right. are so struggling. Right, so the insurance issue, and I appreciate the history on the laws, and again, I hate to keep uh, you know singing the praises of Mac, but Mac was very involved. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, responsible for the very first special education law in the nation, which is right here in Massachusetts, in large part because of the work of Mac, as well as these other laws. I, I, so is this insurance issue to, does that explain why BPS is not following through on providing ABA services for families who have agreed to it and it's, they've signed and it's in the IEP? So what are they the the, the the issues that uh, Ms. well I King? think it's an issue of they continue to hire more and more ABA therapists and that's part of this year's budget in um, the special education department because like other related services it's centrally funded by special ed but it's an issue of finding people to fill those positions that exist across the state and quite frankly across the nation. So there's a, is, uh, so what there's I'm a hearing shortage. you say, there's a staffing issue yes. around workforce development. Across would you agree with that? I wouldn't. And we have, we are, we have two, uh, we have BPS centrally funded people that we have and we also have contracts um, with three or four agencies, maybe five, that we're tr to try to do the backfill of the services that we need, but we, because there's such a So what kind, what's the backlog then? What, what is the, the scale of this problem? If, there, if there's a work shortage in terms of we don't have the staffing to make sure that, our, that students who require the service are getting it, you know that there are, are students who, who need it. So what is that actual need? How many people do, do we need to hire to make sure that every child who deserves and requires ABA services are getting the services that they need. I can get you where we are on the services that might not be being provided right now. I can get you that, that the number. That and and the gap, though. That's gap. what I'm interested sure. in, who's not being served. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of gaps, I noticed, too, um, there were a number of families, I can't remember which slide it was, uh, who had rejected, I guess, the IEP? Yes. What page was that? And then I want to ask a transportation um, question, uh, and then I want to be done, because I really want to hear from data. folks. Yes. Which slide was that? Is it numbered? Oh. That's not, I'm sorry. It's it's not IP I'm sorry. So there was a high yeah, number of fam. thank you, it's this one. It's a high number of families who um, don't have their, their IEP signed. What do we know about that and why? What is happening? Do they, are they not happy with it? Do we know why th there are so many families? So there are 88 rejected IEPs currently, and those could be um, a, a number of reasons. It could be rejected placement where the IEP is accepted, but the location of service has been rejected. Um, it could be a rejection or an omission of service, so I accept the IP in part, but I'd like to see something else added. Do you have an analysis of the breakdown of what it all is, and are we finding uh, certain trends or problems, like a lot of rejections of this particular site over another site? Like, what, what are you able to ascertain from, if you look at this from a systemic standpoint? I don't know. I know you say it's case by case, but I'm just wondering what the data will tell us if um, anything, about what this means? Because it is a very high number. Uh, it, so it's 88 that have been rejected. Okay. There are okay. 1,400 that haven't been signed at all, and that doesn't mean that there's a disagreement yet. It just means the parent hasn't responded. responded. Do we know why? Sometimes it could be just not receiving it, so it has to go, we attempt multiple attempts for it to go in multiple different ways. Uh, there's the portal, there's a backpack, there's mailing home. Um, so it could be that, it, address changes. Sometimes we'll get IEPs back because there's an address change we weren't aware of. Um, as I said, I do have coordinators who will go to the door yeah. <laughs> and try to get that signature, but sometimes parents are out for a certain amount of time. It, the reasons vary widely, but it doesn't necessarily indicate a disagreement yet. Right, and uh, the ones that are not signed, that means that the old IEPs, assuming that there was another IEP already in place, exactly. will continue to be valid right. and be used in terms of those services. Okay, that's helpful. I just wanted to raise this question on on uh, transportation because it's come up at a number of hearings. Uh, thank you for that wonderful timer. Um, just that obviously with the transportation budget, how, how expensive it is to, to bus all of our kids, certainly uh, with students who are receiving door-to-door, -door, even higher, uh, those who are out of district, even higher, um, and obviously any child who requires uh, transportation door-to-door -door or to the corner or out of district, wherever it is, should certainly get the services that they deserve and are entitled to. But I'm wondering from a, a 
a systems perspective, how often are these conversations coming up in IEPs around door-to-door? Uh, -door? And last time, I think you were here, Mr. Grinsom, there was a, a question about this. And one of the things that we learned was there was an effort to see for older children in particular who, um, you know, are having, a, are doing better around social skills and navigating their space around them that perhaps they're uh, being transitioned from the door to the corner, like the nearest corner. So I'm just wondering how this plays out in the IEP process um, as, as, as discussions are happening uh, every day with families. So the uh, transportation need for a student and what the level of service they need if it's door-to-door or corner-to-corner -corner should be discussed every single year in the annual review? No, and I get that it should okay. be. The question is, from a system standpoint, as something that you guys have to manage, is it happening? How do we know it's happening? Uh, what, who is agreeing to you know, go from the door to the corner or not? Why? You know, what are the challenges? What are the barriers? So I know what's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, my, what's supposed to happen and what actually happens sometimes don't line up. So I know, you know, and I know it's a lot of work. So I'm just wondering if there's any, yeah. any insight uh, that you can, because it's come up at a number of hearings. Um, uh, this session. is something I w w was hoping to be able to answer, putting back on my former hat. Um, um, and I think from memory, I know that there were a lot of conversations, um, as you mentioned, especially during the time of a trans transportation challenge, uh, how do we support uh, students and families when students are ready and when families are ready exactly. um, to make those uh, kinds of trans transitions to try to uh, use it as an opportunity, a learning opportunity for students um, um, and even uh, outside of the classroom to have a the sort of least restrictive uh, environment. Um, and so there were many families who were, um, uh, you know, we made phone calls and, um, uh, and also worked with and provided some guidance to schools in terms of uh, conversations that could be had, um, but um, uh, definitely uh, never pressured uh, families and students if they weren't uh, ready to have, you know, make those kind of transitions. Um, and so in terms of the data that was collected, I can go back and work with the operations team to get, you know, more specifics on the data that was collected during that time. That would be helpful. Um, yeah. Thank we'll you, and that. thank you all again, yes. Mm -hmm. Just on the transportation piece, I just wanted to add that um, with regard to whether or not someone gets door-to-door -door transportation, I mean, just like you're supposed to be in inclusion for your school day, that includes transportation to the maximum extent appropriate. Yeah. And so the issue is, is that we always had like either the big school bus and with or without a monitor or the, the small school bus with the one-to-one. -one. We really do need to do some serious training with the par with the monitors on the buses. Mm -hmm. When we have more monitors on a bus than, uh, or the, the same number of monitors as we do children, we're doing something very wrong and spending money needlessly. If we trained individuals that to be bus monitors that understood how to respond to issues, we could decrease the number of monitors that are necessary, and with proper training, we can migrate some of those kids from door to door to the regular school bus. So that's the bigger issue that we need to be looking at. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Jeannie. And just, um, Cindy, if you don't mind, I want to follow up on some of the adding adding seats or adding classrooms mm -hmm. as needed. Have we ever added classrooms or seats in response to the need of a child in a school? So I, uh, classrooms in a school during the middle of the school year, not for one student necessarily, no, but when we're doing our um, projections of, during the budget season that, that we're in right now, um, we put classrooms in what we call reserve uh, that we know we're gonna need later in the year, but we will not need starting in September. So to that fact, the last years we've opened um, three classrooms at the Mattahunt, and we call it the Mattahunt Satellite, that are ABA substantially separate classrooms that we knew we needed, but we opened when we needed it, not from September on, so that we, uh, they opened in, February or, or right at the beginning of March. End of so February, if we had March. a student that had an IEP some time during the uh, a, this current school mm -hmm. year, we'd make them wait until September to be in the appropriate classroom. Oh no, classroom. no, 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 no. But I'm we sorry. wouldn't add the need that they. We wouldn't look to add to meet their need at their current school this current year. So whether it be by staff, classroom, or a classroom seat, we we would not make a student wait from September to March for that classroom to open. No. What the projections include are the number of seats within classrooms in the schools that already exist, and they, these are extra to what we know is coming up that we'll need to open. So no one wait, there's no waiting period for when we place students in those classrooms, they were like, they were ready to go with a classroom size. Right, in September, ago. but if a child during the school year has a either a new or a renewed IEP that now notes a new need, yep. 
we're talking to the families, we're asking them what they like, but if the family wants to keep that child where that child is, which I think is really yep. important, are we adding, are we looking to add services? Have we ever added services to oh, a particular sorry, school building yes, to meet the need of a kid at that time? Yes, especially, and that's usually when you're asking about rejections and where they come from, that might be exactly what it is. The family doesn't want to leave and we will make sure the services in the IEP are placed at the school that they're at. Do we ever, and, and I ask this question uh, because it, it's, been, it's been put to me mm -hmm. that we as a district have either changed IEPs or held off on IEPs so that we aren't necessarily out of compliance mm -hmm. until a child can be in the, an accurate or an appropriate setting mm -hmm. for September. Mm -hmm. Do we do that? Do we ever change, hold off, or uh, modify an IEP mm -hmm. so that we wouldn't be considered so out of compliance? I want to be very clear that the IEP team process and the tenets of the federal and state laws, that is a team process, and there's not one individual changing IEPs it's happening at all. So um, if there's a specific example, I would like to know what it is so we can address it. Um, if there's multiple examples, that's fine. But very clearly in the department that I run, it is very important to me that the team process, especially the family, is as the most important member of that team, are the people around the table making decisions, not one person. Well, I would say compliance is not, again, I said it before, it's not just our legal obligation the to these ethical. kids and to their families, but mm -hmm. it's a moral and ethical obligation Absolutely. to our families. I would also recommend, and I, one of my boys is on a 504, mm -hmm. I can't access that through the SIS. Okay. And I think that those, if we're going to invest, if we have this mm -hmm. investment in technology, that it should be linked to the portal that parents, mm -hmm. I check their grades pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. I'm not happy with the report I just got from my husband. Mm -hmm. um, but we should be able to access that as well. That's I know what his 504 question. says, mm -hmm. but it would be good for nope. it to be, to link to SIS. It's a great suggestion. Um, and, and what is, what is the training that any of our coordinators are receiving, um, the special ed coordinators, because I've, I, Someone has asked me to ask the question, um, implying that we have coordinators that aren't prepared or trained appropriately mm -hmm. to manage team meetings with families and with students and other educators. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about that professional sure. development, that training that's required? Absolutely. So there are 65 mandatory hours per year for coordinators. They meet with me once a month. I get speakers as necessary, as appropriate, so it's a full six hour day. Are they day. trained coming in? Are they licensed coming in? They're certified, they're certified in special education. Okay. They should have experience in special education. Mm -hmm. They should have been through this process. Um, they receive training as they go. There isn't a separate training process to become a coordinator. There's no separate licensure there for it to become a coordinator. Um, we've invested next year for mentors so that they have the extra mentoring for the position, but I meet with them, I train them monthly. They have a separate training from the regular coordinators in so that it's more nuanced and so that they're not in front of 105 other people learning as they go. Um, and they're supported by their assistant directors as well. And do we, um, do we know sort of the average age of the oldest IEP that hasn't been um, renewed or reviewed? Yep. Um. I guess the average and maybe the oldest. I can get that information for you. I actually don't have it in terms of time. Yeah. And what's also, can I just say something about when things seem like they're old or they not haven't been reviewed necessarily? Um, what I've also found coming through is we do have a lot of transiency, obviously, in and out of the district if it's charter or if it's um, going to other districts and living in other communities. Um, at times, students are coming back in and they're not bringing their IEPs from the district they're coming from. So like I said before, if they had an IEP before, we have at least we have that record and we can work on that. But if the parent doesn't bring the most up-to-date IEP with them, um, the, the, last, the oldest IEP is gonna be the one that we had in our system. So I just wanna clarify that piece of it, that if we're moving in and out, mm -hmm. um, obviously if there are services in there, we'll talk with the family if they want us to put those in, into place. Um, while we do a conversion meeting, which we have 30 days to do, we'll do that. But I just wanna make, the, there's, some, there's always anomaly, anomalies. I just wanna explain one nuance that occurs uh, quite frequently for, the, for our district our size. And can um, our reporting system also share sort of that, that timeline information on IEPs, but can it also share how many overdue meetings there are, where missing placements might be? Mm -hmm. um, c will that software be able to share those reports? So I think Councilor Janey asked about an analysis on the 88 rejected IEPs, mm -hmm. sort of what the reason is for those rejections. Mm -hmm. but I'm very curious on the, the number of overdue due meetings, um, the average wait time and any sort of missing placement. So any kids that, 
students uh, within the Boston Public Schools that have been required to have a certain placement as a part of their IEP but don't have that placement. If we can, we can take a look at that. And then last, um, for, the, for the purpose of time, I'm, I'm going to ask the question or sort of put it out there and we can talk about it another time. I'm just so incredibly impressed with the work that's happening at Strive, mm -hmm. um, especially within their program at Wentworth. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to know that that's being replicated in lots of other places, and my understanding it is that it is not, um, that there's a group of students there that really are having access to some high-quality job training, um, some career readiness skills, certainly some um, social skills, workplace good, developing good workplace mm -hmm. habits, but how are we going to grow that program? How are we going to reach out to other organizations and institutions in the city so that these 500 students that are currently in that 18 to 22 year range have an opportunity to have that experience. Diane. Hi, can I just Hi. comment? Hi, absolutely. Um, I just want to also introduce myself. My name is Diane Lashinskis. I've been on, I've been the secretary of the Board of SPEDPAC for 10 years now. My daughter um, just recently aged out of Boston Public Schools. She's 22, so she just went through the whole transition process. And um, I think there are some pockets of really good work being done. You know, you addressed the six. Um, teachers and I do think that is a large issue because I do th believe there's a lot of pressure on individual schools to do a lot of this work and the IEP is supposed to be individualized as long as the transition plan and that's very difficult to do when you have a large cohort of students and to take them out to the community which is really what transition is about. Um, what, what we think is needed and what we actually talked to Dr. Granson about is resource mapping. Boston is a massive city with a lot of opportunities for these students. We should resource map what is out there. That would be extremely helpful for the teachers in the district to know rather than what some of them are doing right now, which is going out and cold calling on a lot of businesses and finding out if their students are welcome there. Um, assessments is key to make it individualized. Transition assessments, I think, happen sometimes, but parents need to be in the know a lot of times to ask for the assessment. Um, another thing is um, a job developer, someone who might work hand in hand with Strive to develop some jobs for these students that are individualized and work with the city of Boston. We have many, many new companies coming in here, and a lot of times we give these job opportunities to students, but where, who is at the table advocating for our students with disabilities? Maybe there should be some type of a job developer to help create those positions and give them to the teachers in the school so they know what is out there and what is available. And lastly, what Carolyn spoke of is a larger investment. I was here in 2013, also with Carolyn, advocating for more funding. We're level funded still to this day. Um, six years later, um, really unfair to the students who deserve more. And I can tell you right now, my daughter now is in the world and state services aren't all what they are cracked up to be and it's not easy. So the more prepared our students are before they leave the um, school system, the better off obviously they will be. Uh, one last thing is on um, the health and wellness. So I joined the Health and Wellness Committee in 2017, I believe, and noticed through their policy that they were supposed to be serving all students. Um, sex education, a, a curriculum for sex education, found out that there was not a specific um, curriculum for students with disability that was modified. We have been working with the, with the district, and they are now looking at different curriculums to work with students with disabilities who are more vulnerable. Um, but what really is needed is a specialized teacher to actually work with the specific schools on this curriculum. So right now that doesn't exist and we're asking for more funding for that position. We're asking for a certified health teacher that's also a special educator mm -hmm. because um, the certified health teachers that the district has do not know how to modify a curriculum to meet the needs of a diverse group of learners. So we, we've talked to uh, Dr. Granson about this and this is something that we need to be added because the district is currently out of compliance with its own policy about health and wellness. Yep. No, great. Thank no, you. and please continue that advocacy. Uh, it's so uh, important. Just a quick uh, follow up on in terms of uh, the transitional services, is that in every school or is it just a, a small subset? 
for so transition services once you turn 14 if you're eligible for special education you start to, you're supposed to start to do transition planning okay? right but is that happening at all of our schools that, that would happen students? that's it's required by law for every student ages 14 up to age 22 but so what that I, looks like is very different that's what I'm asking so Karen. for younger kids it would look like looking at their um, academics or sort of fields of study that would what do you want to do when you get older you don't want to develop a transition plan that the child not interested in right so is the trend so my question just simple transition planning it's happening at all uh, schools high schools or, uh, 14, with, uh, so middle schools those schools with those age starting children. in middle school at age 14 up to the age the of 22 way. on an annual basis wonderful I just want to clarify too with our IEP system that you cannot we cannot release the IEP once a child's in their 13th year they're gonna, if they're gonna turn 14 we can't release the IEP un unless the transition planning form is completed so the IEP has to go with that is my point. You can't get a draft IEP to a parent unless you fill out that form. Okay, so it, that is one of our ways of um, And in know, terms of the STRIVE program, how many students of color are there? Is that for you? We can get those statistics. And the, I want to say, the, well, just who's going to get pulling, that from you? I will get it, okay, yeah, because I want to tell you where we're pulling it from is where uh, who's participating in our partner and uh, with, the, with the partners is that's how we'll be pulling that data. So we'll definitely get the number for you. I think if you're going to pull the Strive data, if you just add where kids are employed or where they're having their internships yes. and the, the, I guess the quality of the internship, but my understanding is some kids are doing something multiple days a week, maybe five days mm -hmm. a week and other students are maybe going out for a shadow experience, which is a one-off yeah. um, type of, of a, an event or experience. I wanna make sure that they're all, um, what, what the quality is of those, those experiences and those internships. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Before, you. can I just oh, also recognize yeah. and uh, yeah, gratitude please, too. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of central office team members here from the special ed office, so we just wanna say thank you for being here as well as, there's lots of staff members as well, but the central well. office, so thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that, and thank you to your uh, team for being here as well. Um, we do have, uh, prior to getting to public testimony, we have one um, BPS teacher and who's also a parent here that would like to offer testimony. So uh, just prior to public testimony, which we'll get into momentarily, I'm gonna ask that Melanie Allen please join us at the uh, front desk. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I don't know why I press the button. It, there it is. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, counselors, for having this hearing and for allowing me this opportunity to speak. My name is Melanie Allen. I'm a teacher in the Boston Public Schools, and I'm the parent of stu two students in BPS. One of my children is on an IEP. The other is not. At their current school, both my children have three adults in the classroom whom they call my teacher. They both get small group instruction and individualized supports. They both have developed empathy and understand that every child needs something different to learn. When my son entered BPS at age three, aging out of early intervention, he was still communicating most of his needs through the sound of a train whistle. When I showed him this speech earlier this week, he said, oh, well, mom, I'm still nonverbal sometimes. When people meet my children, they don't know which one is on the IEP. My story is one of BPS special education success and its failure. Last year, my son, who had always loved school, began crying and begging us to keep him home, and we didn't understand why until we found out that he was not receiving all the special education supports guaranteed by his IEP. His IEP said he was supposed to have 240 minutes per day of specialized instruction. He was actually receiving zero. It turns out my son's teacher had tried to get him the supports that were guaranteed by his IEP, but she was told not to worry about it and to stop talking about it. And she was only a provisional teacher with no job security, so the message was clear. If she wanted to keep her job, she would keep quiet. Thank goodness that someone from outside the school learned about what was going on, not only to my child, and called in a complaint to the district. 
Without that phone call, BPS would have been as in the dark as I was. But now they knew. And in fact, it was very encouraging just now to hear Cindy Nielsen say that it is district policy to hire extra staffing when they know that supports are not in place. That was not my experience. My husband and I asked the district to hire someone who could provide services for my son in the classroom, and they refused repeatedly. We had meeting after meeting. We dipped into our savings to hire an advocate. Finally, the solution was to force other teachers in the building to push in wherever they could to fulfill the minutes of his IEP. Good teachers were staying after school or coming in early or working on their break. Some of his specialized instruction was during lunch. Those were his IEP services. Now, I don't think BPS was intentionally trying to deny students their rights. BPS wants all students to get the education they need. But in BPS, budget constraints outweigh good intentions every time. In the past year, I have met family after family who tell me how their children were denied their services, how they fought for help, but they were buried in paperwork and legalese. I have met teacher after teacher who confide in me that they know they are breaking the law, that they literally cry at night because they know what they're doing is unconscionable. They want to say something, but they are afraid. I am the only teacher on your panel tonight because people are afraid to speak up. I wish my story were unique. I am so lucky that I could afford an advocate, that I have inside knowledge of BPS, that I speak English fluently, that I am educated, and that I am not easily intimidated. I cannot pretend that those factors weren't a huge part of why my children are now in one of the good schools. But even my kids' current teachers say they need more help to truly fulfill all the requirements of their students' IEPs. My experience as a BPS parent of a child with special needs has shown me two equally important truths. One, BPS is capable of providing special education that is not only appropriate, it is life-changing. And two, BPS is denying that opportunity to many children and I'm not even sure that they know what's happening. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Mm. Do you have any questions, Melanie? I just want to say thank you for sharing your story um, and for recognizing your, your own privilege in the situation. And, and so many families uh, do not have that. I mean, when I opened up uh, with my opening comments, you know, talked about my own experience with my grandson. You know, I'd worked at Mac for a number of years. You know, I've got lawyers I can turn to who are my coworkers who were there for me. I'm in this space as an advocate myself, and even still, knowing everything, I know these superintendents personally, have their cell phones, can call them because of my role. Even still, going into those meetings are so intimidating. It is all lawyer talk, it is all doctor talk, and no one is really speaking you know, up for the families. And so I'm so glad that this worked out for you. And, and it's important that we make sure that it works out for the, num the, the so many other students, uh, the 21% of other students who are in, in, in the district who are not getting the supports. Oh, well, I shouldn't say that. Many of those students who are not getting the supports that they need and the services. So thank you for sharing. I know that you've got champions here on the council who will fight right there with you to make sure that, that our students are getting what they need. Um, so thank you for that. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie, for being here. Uh, we'll now shift over to public testimony. As you know, uh, many of you know there are two microphones, left and right, um, for both of us. So I'm going to call a few people up at a time, and if you just queue up at each of the microphones. And um, I, I hope that you'll just keep your comments, your uh, testimony to a few minutes. I don't set the alarm for you because this is your opportunity to talk to us, uh, but I do ask you to be uh, aware of the time. Uh, so we have Jesse Hederman and Kelly Carl, and then following those two, we have Palma McLaughlin and Jalma, maybe with her. Welcome, Jesse. Hi, good evening. 
I will try and keep my testimony as brief as possible, but this is do your, do your best. This is the first time I fail I'm being heard, so I appreciate the opportunity to be here this okay. evening. And Jesse, if I could ask you to just really speak up into that microphone, thank you. My name is Jesse Hederbin. I am the mother of three amazing girls. Molly, 18, a freshman at Northeastern. Sorry. Ella, 15, a freshman in high school, unable to physically attend high school. She is receiving 10 hours a week of tutoring through Boston's Home and Hospital Program. And my youngest daughter, Georgia, a seventh grader at Boston Latin Academy. My girls, like all children, are very different. Their needs, like all children, are very different. I've spent the past three years advocating, advocating tirelessly for my middle daughter, Ella, and fighting to keep her alive. Ella suffers from mental illness. Sorry. She has a diagnosis of major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety, and post-traumatic post -traumatic stress disorder. In March of 2017, Ella was 13 years old in seventh grade. She attempted suicide for the first time and had her first of close to 10 hospitalizations. After every, uh, every hospitalization, Ella tried to transition back to school with the support of family, therapy, psychiatrists, medications, and an IEP. Although she utilized all supports, Ella was not successful in transitioning back. I remember phone calls from school that Ella was found in the bathroom taking apart pencil sharpeners so she could get to the razor blade to slice her arms out to relieve some of the anxiety being at school. Seventh and eighth grade went on like this and she finished a good part of both years at home in home and hospital tutoring. Freshman year we thought would be different. Ella was going to go to Norfolk Agricultural Vocational School in Walpole. Boston agreed to foot the bill because we didn't have any vocational programs like it. Um, she would be able to work with animals and learn skills as, as along with her academics. This would surely be the change that she would need. Two months into school, she had two consecutive hospitalizations, again, utilizing all the supports that her IEP afforded um, and her outside supports, Ella was again unable to tr transition back to school. She felt when she was in school that she wanted to die. People asked, well, just make her go to school. You can't make her, she wants to die. And there are no hospitals for her to go to. At this time, Ella's psychiatrist at Boston Children's Hospital recommended a therapeutic day school. Um, I requested more supports in her IEP, and for over a month, both Norfolk Agricultural and myself tried to reach out to Boston. We called the Welcome Center, we called the Special Education Department, um, and didn't get anywhere. No return phone calls, misinformation, and I didn't get anywhere until I reached out to Counselor George's office, um, and she was able to point me to someone who could help me find out where to go. I began to research therapeutic day schools. Boston has one therapeutic day school, and that's the McKinley School. Anyone who is familiar with Boston Public Schools <laughs> might know of the McKinley. Um, during this time, I started researching private therapeutic day schools as well, only to find that I couldn't get any information other than what was on the computer because you have to be referred by your district. So we waited. A new IEP was drafted, and on February 12th, 2019, we sat down with Boston to discuss placement. I was extremely prepared for the meeting and I was hopeful. I provided Catherine Marcy Bickerton, the Senior Program Director of Mediation and Dispute Resolution for Boston Public Schools, 50 very personal private pages of information that pertain to my daughter's history, her diagnosis. I provided her with discharge paperwork, summary, safety plans. I also provided her with two letters one from her pediatrician of 15 years and the other from her psychiatrist at Boston Children's Hospital requesting the need for a private therapeutic day school as Boston only had the McKinley. Sorry. <clears throat> Many of the students at the McKinley exhibit external behaviors. My child does not exhibit external behaviors. My child my child exhibits internal behaviors. And in times, in times of high stress, my daughter shuts down. She contemplates suicide. 
She engages in self-injurious behavior. Kids at the McKinley, when they're in times of high stress, they throw desks, they flip chairs, they swear. Thank you. This would be traumatic for an internalizing kid with a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. I also express my concern regarding the statistics of the school, such as the graduation rate, out-of-school suspension rate. Unfortunately, Catherine did not look through the packet I gave her, nor did she ask questions about my child, other than what was on that IEP. With that, Catherine verbally recommended the McKinley School. I agreed to keep an open mind, and I went on a tour of the school. Weeks later, finally, someone had reached out to me, and on March 1st, we toured the school. We pulled up to what looked like a prison. The windows all had bars, the blinds were ripped, the building was dilapidated. We were greeted at the lower entrance of the building by an amazing woman, the principal, Tina Stella, um, who then walked us through the building. She first showed us the metal detectors that the students walked through in the morning and how that they would all be wanded down. All of their bags, book bags, pocketbooks would be physically gone through and taken apart. Their phones, their laptops would be confiscated for the whole day. And then these students can go on and start their day. The tour started with uh, a brief of, of the model of the school, which in theory sounds great. The meeting with the principal was interrupted four times so she could personally go and de-escalate students. After we sat down, as we sat down, we asked many questions thoughtful questions that my daughter had prepared herself. Some of the most important questions my daughter had to ask, what clubs do you have? What extracurricular activities do you have? Are there sports here? Do you have prom? The answer to every single one of those questions is no. From there, we started our physical tour of the school. It's a very scary place to be. The high school wing of the school reeked like marijuana, so much so that the principal made a comment and no one cared. No one cared to go see who was smoking pot during the school day. Our first stop was to an English class, to a teacher who I've heard amazing things about. Class was in session and we walked in. There was a student laying on top of three desks. There were two other students in the corner kicking around a Gatorade bottle and three boys in another corner swearing and pushing each other. And this is what we experienced every classroom that we visited. It was frightening. We left that day and my suspicions were confirmed. This was in no way the right placement for my daughter, nor was it the right placement for any child. I never heard from anyone, not until March 27th, when my school reached out to Catherine and she said that we should have contacted them. I don't know anything about this process. I've been too busy advocating for her mental health. This is all news to me. Um, I also took it upon myself at this time to go through um, some data and pull some, some statistics from Boston Public Schools website. These statistics are the 2017 school report card. I compared the McKinley, uh, Boston's one therapeutic day school, to 11 randomly selected high schools. One school skipped two, one school skipped two. Data that I found as a parent was important, and what I found was astounding. I provided copies um, of, of this data, um, and I have, um, I'm sorry. So I provide the statistics of all the schools, and in another graph, I compare the McKinley to the lowest performing schools, the middle of the road schools, and the highest performing schools. The data speaks for itself. The McKinley rated significantly lower in every single area. Four areas that I have highlighted that were especially alarming. The four-year graduation rate. The, at the McKinley, three out of every 10 kids will graduate high school. At the lowest performing schools, five out of every 10 kids will graduate high school. 
Of those three out of 10 kids that will graduate, only two out of 10 of those kids will go on to college. The annual dropout rate at the McKinley is quite astounding. Two out of every 10 kids will drop out. At the lowest, six out of 10 kids will drop out. Out of school suspension, something that is extremely important to me. My daughter, as I said, has a, a diagnosis of PTSD. She suffered a trauma. She's a kid whose safety to her always is something she feels could be compromised at any time. The out of school suspension rate is to almost 25%. That means that one in every four kids may have an out-of-school suspension. And the last thing, the last statistic is um, core academics taught by highly qualified teachers. I'm not quite sure what that means, um, but at the McKinley, only three and a half out of every 10 teachers are highly qualified. At the best performing school, Nine out of every 10 teachers are highly qualified. Why should I, as a parent, accept for my daughter a school where nearly six and a half out of every 10 teachers are not highly qualified? Just like this teacher said here, I am a person who has English as my first language. I can advocate for my child. It's been at a huge cost. There are so many kids there that don't have that. They don't have parents that are involved in their lives at all. As a matter of fact, a lot of their parents graduated from the McKinley School. Doesn't anybody care about these kids? The last thing I wanna leave you with is a little blurb my daughter wrote. And this was after we visited the McKinley School. The minute we pulled in, I felt bad energy in my body. I felt trapped, like the vibes I got in the hospital. It was like the air let out anxiety and traveled through my veins. There's barely any windows, and why are the ones I see so small? I wanna leave and nothing in my mind and body feels right. I feel so uncomfortable. I wanna go to a school where I feel safe and comfortable. I want to go to prom and make memories. I am tired of doing school from my dining room. I'm missing out on memories I deserve. I would also like to note that at this meeting, I did request private placement. I requested that packets be sent out and I was rejected. I also have, I feel like we've there's several procedural violations. Um, one thing that's noted in the special education uh, laws and regulations, uh, under placement and service options, uh, there is, uh, I guess it's 28.06B, I'm not sure. Um, it states that consideration must be given to any potential harmful effect on the student or on the quality of ser services that the student needs. That, that didn't happen. Also, another, another violation I feel is, is prior to the placement meeting, the school district and parents shall investigate in-district and out-of-district placement options in light of the student's needs. That didn't have it happen. There are several, of, several other things in here I feel um, that she didn't receive and you know, I, I don't feel like we were afforded due process. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Jesse, thank you very much. Thank you. Kelly. Thank you, counselors, for your time, and thank you very much for your testimony. It was very powerful. Um, my name is Kelly Carl. I am a pediatric neuropsychologist. That's Kelly, if I could just have you get speak right louder. that microphone. Nobody has ever Good. told me to speak louder. <laughs> um, so, that story is not uncommon. I will try to be quick. Um, my daughter Josephine was born at 26 weeks, weighing just over a pound. 
and a half. She suffered very significant bleeds in her brain to the point where the uh, hospital was not sure that she would live. So after we brought her home, she got early intervention from the day we arrived home. She was on oxygen for a year. EI came, they provided, by the time she reached her third birthday, nine hours of services per week. Um, research on the child brain suggests the greatest amount of neuroplasticity occurs prior to the age of eight. Her EI team wanted to see her succeed and were willing to provide as much support as they could to make that happen. Children who are born as early as Josephine are have a 70 to 85 percent likelihood of developing ADHD, learning disabilities, and other problems, so early intervention is extremely important in cases like that. Prior to her third birthday, she was tested to see if she qualified for IEP services. I sat in the room as the psychologist, the speech pathologist, and the occupational therapist stadium tested her. And if you know anything about how testing works, that is not the way it works. Um, basically, that invalidated her entire protocol, but when I brought that up, it was dismissed. She then was rejected for services, um, and I fought, and I fought, and I fought, and I fought, and finally, all I asked for was PT and OT at that point. I mean, I was not asking for inclusion. I was not asking for one-to-one -one paras. I was not acting, asking for a big financial drain on the district. I was asking for bi, you know, weekly OT and PT. Finally, I get OT and PT. And again, as so many others have pointed out, I had the time and the energy and the wherewithal to advocate for those things. And there are so many children whose families do not. This is the battle my husband and I have faced since our child aged into the public school system in Boston. I left my full-time job as a pediatric neuropsychologist, and I am very thankful that I have the time and the energy to devote to this because I cannot fathom being a full-time working parent and trying to fight this battle. And it's for baby amounts of services. Because of my concerns with BPS and with my daughter's needs and she fatigues easily, I could not enroll her in a full-time BPS program. I chose St. Teresa's School in West Roxbury, a private school. During her K-0 year, I faithfully took her out of school, brought her to the Linden Pilot School, brought her back to school to make sure she received her services. This year, they have and uh, sort of rolled out this program about being able to receive her homes, her services in her home school at St. Teresa's rather than disrupting her educational experience. Um, at the end of October, services finally commenced. Two weeks later, the OT session stopped. Apparently, the provider hired to work with Josephine was no longer handling her services. And how did I learn about this? Not through her provider or through BPS as legally mandated because they were no longer in compliance with her IEP. My four-year-old daughter told me, and only when I asked how it was going. Shame on a system that makes a four-year-old more accountable than the adults charged with helping her. Once services stopped, I heard nothing. I emailed every human at BPS I could think of from the top down, and no one replied for weeks. After several weeks, I finally started emailing Mayor Walsh, some of the city councilor's offices, and any other politician I could possibly think of, and then I received a response within 24 hours providing me with a compensatory services arrangement. The agreement was signed on December 11th, almost halfway through the school year. She was one of those children who have services who are not receiving them despite what Boston Public Schools would like you to believe. The only reason I know that she receives her services now is because her teacher very kindly places a note in her folder and lets me know. I have heard zero communication from BPS. I actually had her IEP meeting this morning and lo and behold, I show up here and there's a patient or a parent portal I've never heard of. Two years in BPS and I've never heard of it. I'm not alone. There are a number of parents in St. Teresa's who are frustrated and their wits end with the Boston public school system. One father went to get a T student designation and requested an initial evaluation at one of the welcome centers and was laughed at and told, good luck. He still hasn't heard from BPS. I'm pretty sure that is also not in compliance. Another family told me they did not want to go through the hassle of having their child evaluated despite the child needing assistance because the process is, quote, broken. Another parent had the same experience that we did where the services simply stopped because the provider left and the parents were not notified. 
We have several students at St. Teresa's who need reading support services. Thus far, BPS has not provided a reading specialist to these students. They have reportedly provided the parents with the option to leave work in the middle of the day and transport their children independently to another school for services, thereby ensuring maximum disruption to a parent's work day and a student's learning. Another parent requested an independent evaluation for their child and were given incorrect information. Yet another parent does not even bother attempting to have her child receive the services to which she's entitled because it is, quote, too difficult to work with the SPED system. The list goes on and on, and there are only 30 students or so at St. Teresa's who are on IEPs. I cannot fathom the rest of the Boston public school system. This is why, if they are financially able to do so, so many families are leaving this wonderful city and looking elsewhere for better educational opportunities for their children. I know of 18 families that have moved in the past two to three years for this very reason. We are residents, we are taxpayers in the city, and we are legally entitled to a system that provides the services necessary for our children to learn and hopefully succeed. As a parent and as a professional in this field, I am horrified that when it comes to some of the most vulnerable and at-risk children, Boston Public Schools and the IEP process are simply failing them. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Palma? Hi, my name is Palma McLaughlin. I'm from Dorchester. Um, I had a very discouraging day yesterday. Um, my daughter and I were at her IEP meeting. I left angry. She left demoralized, discouraged, and ready to give up. My daughter is 16 years old. She suffers from an episodic disability. An episodic disability does not show up all the time. It's all here. She's good one day. She may not be good the next day. She has chronic medication-resistant ocular migraines with aura. This requires small accommodations, like preferential treating, pre preferential seating, or being allowed to carry a water bottle. It also requires bigger accommodations because a debilitating migraine can strike at any time and, and causing excessive absences and the need for good communication so she can get her missing work. In an educational setting, um, she presents virtually the same as a student with sickle cell disease. The reason I mention sickle cell is because last year, the Boston Public School System entered into a voluntary resolution with the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights for systematic discrimination against students with sickle cell disease, a, an episodic disability. My daughter's disability mimics that in an educational setting. Different medically, same, same in, in the classroom. There is, one, there is a big difference, though. SCD is predominantly African-American and Hispanic. Migraine sufferers are predominantly female. 37% of uh, females of reproductive age compared to 6% of men, and 85% of chronic migraine sufferers are female. My daughter attends one of Boston's exam school and repeatedly and persistently over the last four years, members of the administration have strongly suggested that she transfer schools on several occasions recommending that she go to level four or level five schools. I was pulled into a meeting. I was told I had to get there and what was, it was, it was three administrators at the school telling me that there were better places for her to go. The federal law requires BPS to provide her with free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive setting. For Boston exam school, she's currently at one of Boston's elite exam schools, but this means transferring her to, at the recommendation of the exam school, to a level four school with an 18.9% disab disabled population, a level four school with a 20% disabled population, a level five school with a 20.1% disabled population. When she discussed this with her peers, because she does have friends, she has very good social emotional health and everything like that, with the exception she has a chronic illness. Her peers who knew, were familiar with these schools said the transfer would be fine because she could stay in a segregated classroom all day and they would bring the assignments to her. That is, she could be labeled full inclusion, but be substantially separate. This is not exactly the least ex uh, 
uh, restrictive environment, and it's not exactly appropriate for someone who has expressed aspirations and the ability to go on to medical school. She wants to join Doctors Without Borders. And by the way, this was the first time I have heard about uh, the requirement for a transition plan. My daughter is now 16 years old, will soon be 17. Over the past four years, we've struggled to get the school to acknowledge her 504 plan from her previous school, obtain a new 504 plan, upgrade to an IEP, get home and hospital tutoring, maintain the tutoring, and just getting the school to follow the IEP. She has not been provided with materials or assignments as required by the IEP. The assignments she has been provided have often been cryptic and inadequate, such as write, an ex write, write a reflective essay on what was done in class today. She wasn't in class. Or do the work, finish the worksheet done in class today. Again, no worksheet, no class. This year, she has finally gotten approved for a tutor through Holman Hospital for six hours. And it has been a godsend because now at least we are getting a portion of the assignments that she needs to do. However, the district does require that I provide new paperwork every eight weeks to continue tutoring. Every eight weeks, new paperwork. She has been retained in grades specifically due to absenteeism related to her disability, despite having passing grades on paper. Yesterday, at her latest IEP meeting, we were informed that she has stay put rights to the end of the year, and then she will need to go somewhere else. It appears this has been the strategy for the last several years coming to fruition. In fact, the first year I was there, I was told, well, maybe she, shouldn't be, she should be someplace more, less challenging until she gets over it. I spent a good, time, time, good deal of time last evening trying to convince her that dropping out because it was too, she was too difficult to, to educate was not her only viable option. But I confess, I don't know if her migraines and how complicated they make the school's job leave her with any viable options. Yesterday's stress exacerbated her pain level. She was not in school today. Thank you very much. Um, Megan Bell and then Gabrielle Nicola. Thank you. We also have Mike uh, Zokla and Jeremy Apolli or Aponte. We should just have you type these into a computer. Welcome. Go ahead. Thank you, counselors. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak today. My name is uh, Gabriel Nicolau, I go by Gabe, and uh, me, me and my wife, Lara Nicolau, we are recent parents of an adopted child from China. Um, her name is Felicity Nicolau. And I would like to um, tell you about our overall experience um, with BPS in uh, trying to obtain IEP services. So we, we're writing as parents of a child with special needs currently receiving IEP services from Boston Public Schools. Um, my wife actually has additional perspective and, and experience having worked as a speech language pathologist at a public elementary school in a Boston suburb. And throughout the evaluation IEP process, we felt often overwhelmed. And can I imagine how difficult it must be for families who are not familiar with this process? We'd like to provide some specific examples of some of the barriers families face when trying to seek educational supports from BPS. The first barrier families face is enrollment at the Welcome Center. We visited the Welcome Center this summer, and at the time, the computer network for BPS was down. The network remained down for several days, and as a result, we were unable to enroll our daughter to BPS or request for a special education evaluation. Given that these offices were open and staffed, why did we have to return another day to hand in our paperwork? For families with less flexible work schedules, this could be a significant barrier. Ultimately, we felt very uncomfortable trusting a lottery system with our daughter's safety before an IEP was even developed. So we requested an evaluation, for, we requested for a full evaluation from BPS. In the meantime, we pursued the option of a nearby Paris school. We ended up at St. Teresa, similar to Kelly. 
And with one phone call, we were able to tour the school, meet the principal. We were able to discuss our daughter's needs and the supports the school would be able to provide. In contrast, we waited several weeks to receive a response from BPS to our request for just an evaluation. At the Welcome Center, we were not told how long to expect to wait, nor were we given a phone number to contact if we had any questions or concerns. Ultimately, we heard back from BPS after my daughter's first day at, at the parish school because the vice principal made a call to BPS regarding our daughter. I wish that I kept better records of the date we requested evaluation and other dates to demonstrate just how BPS ignored the special education timelines throughout the entire process. And once the evaluations were completed, the process was no smoother. We felt that the team chair at the IEP acted as a gatekeeper, attempting to keep supports to a minimum. I imagine that many other families have felt the same. I would like to provide some examples of this, and in order to really help you to understand, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about my daughter. She is five years old. I mentioned that she was adopted from China. Um, she has significant brain structure differences, including the absence of a large portion of her cerebellum on the back of her head. This affects her walking. She is very unsteady and she falls frequently. She has low muscle tone, which impacts her fine motor access to classroom activities, and she has some visual impairment. Her cognitive abilities are difficult to determine given her status as an as a English learner. And her limited and also her limited exposure to certain concepts prior to this year. At the evaluation meeting, we felt the team chair repeatedly tried to minimize the significance of our daughter's disability. After the evaluations were reviewed, the team chair requested the team to identify a disability category for our daughter. The team chair, who had not evaluated our daughter, suggested a category of developmental delay. The evaluating psychologist then intervened to indicate that our daughter has an identified neurological impairment. And when discussing accommodation supports, the evaluating, evaluating physical therapist recommended a one-on-one -on -one aid. And our, daugh our daughter's teacher strongly supported this, noting the frequent falls and indicating that the current classroom aid has been serving as our daughter's de facto aid. So in uh, my daughter's classroom, there are two teachers. The um, second teacher is basically um, serving as our, as our daughter's aid because she just falls down all the time. The team chair, however, indicated that more data would be needed in order to support this decision for a one-on-one -on -one professional and proposed, proposed a data collection period of six to eight, eight weeks, so up to two months in order to determine in, in order to determine the additional help. We felt that this was an extremely long time to delay a decision re related to our daughter's safety and requested an earlier meeting. In response to concerns about our daughter's safety, the team chair recommended a helmet, and we felt, again, this suggestion was inappropriate. It seemed to acknowledge that our daughter's safety was a concern, but that BPS was not interested in providing any support. In the end, we had to wait eight weeks to reconvene and discuss in discuss a one-on-one -on -one aid, which at which time just a week's worth of data was considered sufficient to document our daughter's frequent falls throughout the day. We were initially offered only a trial of a one-on-one -on -one aid for our daughter. Our daughter's school advocated for the aid to be fully included in the IEP rather than a temporary support. A BPS administrator at the meeting agreed to this, yet the team chair continued in, in, to insist on that trial period. Ultimately, the supervisor prevailed and a one-on-one -on -one paraprofessional support was included in the IEP. Our daughter continues to wait for the support as the position has only recently posted. And we share these experiences not to advocate for special treatment for my daughter's case, but to serve as an example of how BPS presents ongoing challenges and delays to parents seeking necessary support for their children. If anything, we believe the process was helped by a supportive school team at St. Teresa's. And for families who are less familiar with the IEP process that may not have, that may not support from their child's school team, face a language barrier or other challenges, and imagine that it would be even more difficult to ensure appropriate support. And even currently, um, we, in the, or actually in the initial IEP, certain aspects of it when we had requested for uh, one-on-one paraprofessional aid 
uh, seat in an inclusion class, extended school year ser services and transportation. Those were rejected by the team chair and not given a reason, even though we had requested over and over again, what, are the, what is the reason for rejection? Um, additionally, Additionally, when we re partially rejected the first IEP that we received, um, we did not receive a letter for appeal or mediation um, because we believe that it was never reported um, when, we, when we had rejected that IEP. So something wrong with the process as well. And we still not, don't have quite what we're looking for in our current IEP because we're told that from a placement standpoint, she's in K-1 right now. We're told that she, we would have to yank her out of her current um, place in K-1, move her to K-2 in Boston Public Schools, and that the, according to discussions with the principal at the end of the year, if appropriate, we would hold her back for K-2 so that she would ha be in K-2 next year, um, which I feel that is um, very inappropriate and when we had told them which school um, we did not want, but which school what we would like to consider, we were given placement for the exact school that we told we did not want. <laughs> so overall, um, we were very disappointed in the uh, process, and the, we hope that, you know, that there's an opportunity for other parents to really share their experiences with the Boston Public School, and we thank you for your work for helping to improve the public schools and helping to improve the overall IEP process. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I also have Mike, Jeremy, Antoinette, and Phyllis. You wanna make your way down and uh, queue up. I also recognize that some people may have signed in to testify, but not realizing it was to testify. You can pick a mic and then uh, introduce yourself. Phyllis, we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Phyllis McLean, and I'm a vice principal at the St. Teresa School in West Roxbury. Um, so I'm just going to, there are a few things that I wanted to kind of jump back on, but um, I'm here tonight to discuss the ongoing difficulties we've had dealing with BPS Special Ed Department. I was, under full disclosure, I was employed by BPS for 30 years, retiring in July of 2018. I held many positions, including teacher, citywide team chair, supervisor of compliance, senior program director of mediation and dispute, and secured my credentials as a school psychologist. I accepted a position as vice principal at St. Teresa School um, and started immediately upon leaving BPS, the next day, as a matter of fact. One of my responsibilities being overseeing the special ed department. Approximately 10% of our students have IEPs and the process is obviously done by BPS. As I reviewed IEPs, I noticed many were not current and, um, sorry, I should have brought my glasses. And when I reached out to schools, I was told the child no longer appeared in the BPS system. Apparently this IEP system that Ms. Alice Thomas addresses has drops, continually drops private school children from the system, um, ne you know, hard to be found. Um, apparently, the process for these children is known as a T, or the, um, is cumbersome, inefficient system. Parents go to the Welcome Center, um, explain to staff they need a special ed available for the child, and the obstacle course begins. Parents are reporting delays between six weeks to the most recent eight months to um, hear anything um, from the school. Um, by law um, to finally receive consent to start the evaluation. Um, we know by law they should have their consent in hand within five days. That never happens. Um, one of our families attempted to start in the summer, I think it may be, um, and finally had the January meeting, which um, this gentleman just spoke about. They tried to access it in summer in January with a um, partial IEP and then one more, almost a full year. And this child's very, very strong developmental window. She's a little girl with a lot of needs and it was really a disgrace. And I think hopefully that I was able to nudge this process along given my contacts in, in BPS. Um, the, um, we've had other parents uh, who have gone down to request evaluations and of younger children for speech previously identified 
areas of disability. They were told at the Welcome Center they would not issue them a T number, that they had to go through a screening. That is not mandated by law. They have made avail available the child find that I believe Ms. Nielsen um, referenced, that they now have is finally compliance with federal law around proportionate share. And so that's a whole other area that I probably won't get into tonight, but you know, people said, oh, that's kind of nice. You know, that should have been man, that's mandated by federal law that they have child fine and they're finally reaching out to the kids. Um, uh, let me just, you know, I do want to say with this whole process, because it's, it's one that we constantly um, inc uh, up against, trying to get the kids these numbers, these T numbers, um, we did have a wonderful woman who has unfortunately since left the department who worked tirelessly to make this happen. Um, we had a parent go down and try to get a number and they were told by the Welcome Center, this person left, we have five people working on it and nothing happens, your kid wasn't picked up. Um, so it's just a system in chaos. I had reached out many, many times to the folks in BPS to try to partner with them to let's work together, you know, it's like the old saying, if you can't change what you won't acknowledge, if we can't acknowledge that we have a huge problem here, we're never gonna change it. I've been met with resistance, um, myself and the principal who's also a former BPS special education administrator, um, know how to navigate the system. We have sent numerous emails to the special ed department, Ms. Nielsen and company, no responses. We were told that the superintendent of Catholic schools told them not to communicate with us. It's totally false. I have it through the superintendent. It was one particular issue on the federal funding that we, they were going to oversee. Um, we have every step of the way, um, kids going to team meetings, if there's a team meeting, such as you know the ones we've talked about today, by law, they are required to invite someone from the child's private school to be a member of the team. We were finding about team meetings through the parents and hey, you know, Phil's gonna come to the meeting, never heard about it. Go to the school, they would say, we don't have to invite you, we've been told we don't have to invite you. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, all of these sort of things, kind of these procedural problems that we've really encountered. Um, I don't wanna be repetitive. Um, so, you know, I, I guess kind of jumping forward, it has been a nightmare dealing with BPS special ed to the detriment of our kids. Um, we, uh, I was going, however, and do I know the special ed system? I absolutely do. I've done it for 30 years, I should. That was met with resistance. Um, several weeks ago, received a call from Catherine, Kathy Mayers, who's the superintendent of Catholic schools, saying she had received a call um, uh, that Ms. Nielsen had initiated two Office of Legal Advisors, Boston Public Schools, saying that I was in violation of conflict of interest law, um, and that I quote unquote, and I'm not making this up, Catherine Mears is a very um, good reporter, that I knew too much, and therefore was perceived as intimidating, and I was um, subject to criminal, criminal uh, uh, prosecution and penalty if I were to go to and deal with any more of our Boston kids. You couldn't make it up. I went to a number of people, um, very upsetting. I feel like I was defamed. The Catholic school office, they were all buzzed. Um, I finally went to the state ethics committee and uh, turned the case over to Eve Slattery, chief, uh, chief counsel for the, uh, for the state ethics committee. Uh, they were flabbergasted along with retirement. They said, I'm absolutely, I'm working in the private industry. Nothing that I did in Boston is overlapping in any way, shape, or form. Um, I have all these letters. I have the letter that was generated from the, not only did she call Kathy Mears to threaten me, to stay out and defame me. Um, in addition, they wrote, they put it in writing. They put it in actual writing that I was too familiar with the, the rules, the regulations, so on and so forth, the BPS, and I should cease immediately working with Boston kids. Um, what I do with that, I don't know where I go with it. I don't like schoolyard bullies, and I don't like being threatened when I'm trying to help kids. I think that um, the parents at St. Teresa's would strongly, <laughs> thank you, strongly, appreciate my help in navigating this system to get their kids services. Um, 
So, you know, why, do, why am I here? We, to help BPS do better, we wanted to partner with them. Our kids are BPS residents. They are not from other communities. Their parents are citizens, taxpayers. We wanted to partner. Let's make the system better. Um, the response has been so horrendous. And secondly, and very important and close to my heart, I have a daughter who works in the Boston Public Schools Special Ed Department as a coordinator, one of 100. Um, I am so fearful of her being retaliated against because of my actions. I have been in unquestionably retaliated against for my participation in the IEP meetings. I will gladly share all my documents from superintendent of Catholic schools, from Office of Legal Advisors, and I really do say, with the situations we're hearing about, do the folks down in Office of Legal Advisors and Special Ed really have nothing better to do with their time than come after me for simply trying to help the children with disabilities in the city of Boston. They have other things to do. Get on some of these placement issues, overdue meetings, and you know, and as I said, I put it on the record because I fear, you know, I retired. I, you know, there, there's only so much you can do. I fear for the retaliation of my daughter and one niece, and I want that on the record. And you know, hopefully we stand committed um, to trying to help do better. We only have, we have about 30, 35 kids on IEPs. However, within the Catholic school community, there are thousands. We have lots of kids. They're a powerful force. And as you can see um, with Kelly and Gabe, they are, um, they are organizing and they are come becoming a force of longly neglected people in the community. They deserve better and we're here to thank you for really stepping in and helping this because this, what has happened to me is a disgrace. And I will share my letter from Eve Slattery saying I absolutely am in no conflict and yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you very yeah. much. Please introduce yourself for the record, thank you. Sure, is this good distance? It's on, they just okay. talk into it. Cool, thanks. Um, my name is Mike Skolka. I, uh, I'm the special ed coordinator at Excel High School in, in Southie. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I got to say, actually, following especially the parents' testimony, I'm sorry that that was your experience. Uh, my testimony isn't nearly as powerful. Thank you for sharing that, and uh, thank you. I just wanted to say that first. Um, yeah, as as a coordinator, I uh, I hold IEP meetings, I write the IEPs, and I do a lot of other things along those lines. Um, I also want to pause and mention that I don't speak on behalf of all coordinators, right? This is based on uh, my 15 years of experience, much of it in New York City, a uh, couple different schools in Boston. Some will agree with what I'm going to say, and, you know, and some may not. Um, I wanted to talk today about a big part of the IEP process, uh, determining placement for students. I especially want to focus on the negative impact of uh, substantially separate programs where students with disabilities are separated from their peers. And in my experience, I guess especially in high school, where they often, uh, they're stigmatized and made to feel like they just don't belong. Um, I frequently hear from these students their frustration, uh, especially their, their lack of motivation, I'd say. Um, for many of them, they've been in these sub-separate programs for much of their academic lives. Uh, one student I was speaking with this morning as I was thinking about what I would say uh, explained how lonely and left out it makes him feel at school. Uh, he thinks other students laugh about him and, and like his peers in the sub-separate program. Now, I, I actually, I don't think his peers are laughing at him. I, I think that uh, the issue is, is that being kept separate makes him self-conscious. Uh, and it makes him feel like he has less value in being there in the building. Um, we have an obligation to educate our students in the least restrictive environment, and uh, we must ensure that our students with disabilities have access to the curriculum and the same opportunities as their non-disabled peers, uh, and that they are not restricted by their disabilities. Equity and access are civil rights issues and also moral issues. Um, equity and access must drive our decision-making processes in school and in society at large. So 
All that said, students ask me every day to put them in larger classes. I mean, obviously it's not that simple, requires team meetings, requires a lot. Um, but it is fair to ask, why, why do coordinators continue to place students into these substantially separate programs? Uh, there, there's a simple answer. Boston Public Schools does not appropriately staff nor appropriately fund inclusion programs. Um, <laughs> classrooms where students with disabilities are educated alongside their uh, non-disabled peers. Most current inclusion programs, most, uh, typically consist of one teacher who is double or triple certified. Um, for students who do need more direct kind of human support, uh, for learning disability, for emotional reasons, for anything. There's minimal support for them, and so they are forced into small classrooms where they're kept separate from their classmates. This will continue until BPS creates a district-wide policy that takes inclusion seriously. We need to change the way we approach educating students with disabilities. We need more inclusion programs, and at a minimum, we need to have two teachers in inclusion classes one special education teacher and one general education teacher. Uh, we need to create classroom environments in which all students can succeed equally. Thank you for your Thank time. You. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mike. Next. I think it's um, Jer Jeremy. Yeah. Yep. Jeremy Aponte. Um, hi, y'all. Um, I'm a teacher at the Mario Umana Academy, and I'm speaking on behalf of the teachers at the Umana Academy in East Boston. I'm a fifth grade teacher. Um, some of my coworkers showed up, and they have much more thorough and specific testimony that um, I want to make time for them to give, so I'm actually going to be very brief, for real. All right, so um, in short, our students are not being serviced or provided access to special education services despite requests from staff, families, and physicians. Um, from K to three, we're being told not to refer them as we are a dual language school, so the assumption is that all these problems amount to language. Um, and this includes requests from native Spanish speakers who are expressing serious concerns with students, um, only to have those requests dismissed because the students are bilingual. Um, this has been my experience as well with students. Oftentimes when um, issues arise and we would like to identify that student, we're told that it has to do with them being Latino or being a Spanish speaker. Um, um, so, sorry, so basically um, these students in the lower grades, K through three, once they reach grades four and five, um, were, were given information that the teachers were concerned in the past, but again, those concerns are kind of put off to the side. And by the time that they hit middle school, we're told that it's either a language issue or it's basically too late to address some of these concerns. Um, I think some of my coworkers can give more thorough um, testimony in relation to those specific experiences. We've compiled a lot of information and data related to that. Um, but we're a school with over a thousand students. We have two substantially separate programs, and we only have um, 101 IEPs in September. Out of 500 elementary students, there are currently four IEPs in general education. Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade resource room teachers are also prohibited from adequately servicing the students that are, sorry, servicing their students um, as outlined in their IEPs um, because their um, pullout services are not allowed. But by next year, our support staff um, will be cut in half. Um, so, in short, our students definitely deserve special education support, and we also need the funding to ensure that we can execute that successfully. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Internet, welcome. And then on deck, I have um, Eileen and Carver and Barbara DeVici, maybe? Hi, my name is Antonetta Brownell, and I am a proud parent of my son and my other son who just got into the Curtis Giles School, so I'm really excited about that. Great school. Um, so I'm a parent of a child there, but I'm also a teacher at the Conley Elementary School. And I had the pleasure of participating in the BTU Teacher Leader Program a couple of years back. Um, we did send out invites to kind of get people to come and listen to research. So since not so many people came, I thought I'd bring the research to you guys. So I'm just gonna read my paper. 
Um, I do have some visuals that I can kind of give you guys later if you want to look it over, but I just wanted to read my research, and uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to share. So the purpose of the study is to identify improvements to the early child education delivery in inclusion classrooms, especially kindergarten, not only traditional K-2, but also what is commonly labeled preschool, which is K-0, K-1 within the Boston Public Schools. Data for this study was collected from surveys of inclusion instruction participants in VPS, including classroom teachers, inclusion specialists, and early childhood supervisors, as well as principals and parents. Now, the questionnaire investigated how prepared educators are to teach students with special needs, both from, excuse me, resources perspective, as well as planning and experience standpoint. In addition, the questionnaire examined pathways for student entry and placement into inclusion classroom. It was concluded that insufficient instructional aid exists for students with special needs and that adequate testing and placement of students with special needs is needed. As a backdrop to the study, the national data and research we obtained was from the proceedings of the National Academy of Science as well as research from the Center of the Developing Child at Harvard University. This research emphasizes the importance of early intervention in education of children with special needs and contrasts current practice, which defers attention with an ideal that translates into an improved learning outcome and student earnings potential, as well as long-term savings to federal and state systems. It was concluded that BPS should increase investment in early childhood, in, uh, early childhood inclusion in a number of tangible ways, including providing pathways for paraprofessional education, increased utilization of inclusion specialists in K0, K1, improved, improved screening and placement of children, and establishment of uh, possibly separate three-year-old classrooms. Um, the two most comprehensive longitudinal studies on the subject show a direct correlation between early intervention and increased educational outcomes, reduced special education needs, and overall cost savings across systems. In addition, inclusion services are most effective when implemented early in a consistent manner and with sufficient resources and time for planning and communication. In 2014, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education released BPS special education statistics that illustrated three important areas of improvement, especially in regards to early childhood education and inclusion practices. One of them was the expansion of inclusion opportunities and programs skirting away from the historical placement of more than 40% with disabilities in substantially separate classrooms. Two, a re-evaluation of how inclusion specialists are deployed, potentially expanding their work in K0, K1, and providing uh, parity between K2 and K1 with regards to typical children with those on IEPs. Currently, 60% of our students in K0, K1 are typical, as contrasted with K2, which is 75%. Couples with testing and placement inadequacies, these ratios are often skewed towards a 50-50 ratio between typical and IEP children in K0, K1. Also, a three-year-old in IEP presents added needs for the current level of service of one teacher and one paraprofessional that are ill-equipped to meet, reducing the efficiency of the entire classroom learning environment as supported from um, the survey. I'm kind of going to skip the methodology because of time, but um, the results in the conclusion show that most classrooms have a lack of resources to support students with disabilities. There's not enough educational support staff and existing support staff are not properly trained for special education cl um, classrooms. Also, there's a high rate of special education referrals. Overall, educators were positive about educating students with disabilities in a general education setting, but they've also expressed a concern regarding how best to meet the educational objectives with limited resources. Many educators preferred a model consisting of general education teacher, special education teacher, and paraprofessional. So some of the recommendations are elevate early intervention programs, maybe implement mandatory screenings prior to K-1 entry to inform proper placement of students in environment that will best support their needs, provide increased opportunities and incentives for paraprofessional education and training, increase special education delivery in inclusion classrooms, expand inclusion specialist roles to include early childhood classrooms, 
um, in K0, K1, and strive for the two-teacher model, one paraprofessional. Um, provide a one teacher with dual education, special need certification, or two highly qualified trained paraprofessionals um, level, um, excuse me, on the level of a one-to-one -one para rate because of their work and an early childhood setting. And um, I just thought, there's one thing I wanted to add here. So part of the two studies, I just wanna, this is the last thing I'm gonna say, but the research that was investigated um, was by the Epsidarian study, and it demonstrates that investment in early childhood education play, pays sizable dividends later, not only to individual learners, but also to society at large. If we can establish sustained impact in the lives of our early learners, it will transform the outcome of their entire life, opening up opportunities for success they may not otherwise have known. It will not only propel individuals forward by increasing their capacity to achieve, but it will elevate our entire society also. So we must look beyond our immediate bottom line to consider the true cost of funding decisions we make today, because the converse to be shared vision of opportunity is also true. By not spending money, more money early, we forfeit our bright future. In the end, we spend more to be reactive than we would to be proactive. And these opportunity costs are too great to ignore. Thank you. Thank you, Antoinette. Eileen, Ben, and Barbara. Good evening, and thank you, Councillors Asabi George and Councillor Janie, for organizing this hearing. My name is Eileen Carver. I've been a teacher in the Boston Public Schools since the mid-1990s. I'm also a parent of two VPS graduates. I currently teach second grade at the Dudley Street School in Roxbury. I have worked at seven different VPS schools in the 20 years that I've been a teacher. Often, the reason I decided to leave a school had to do with the poor treatment of students with special needs. I felt like I was complicit, working in contexts that did not begin to meet the needs of the range of learners before us, and I refused to participate in it. The problem was not that teachers weren't working as hard as they possibly could, but rather that they were insufficient servants, services to meet our students' needs. At the Dudley Street School where I work now, we have more learning specialists than some schools have to assist with servicing our most challenged students. But still, it is not sufficient, and next year, we are losing one learning specialist due to budget cuts. I am one of those teachers um, I think you've heard about who are triple certified. I have my regular education cer uh, certification for teaching children with moderate disabilities, and I'm certified to teach English language learners. There are many of us. However, it is not possible to meet the needs of 20, 25 students in one classroom with only a single teacher. To give just one example, if you have a student whose IEP states that, um, that they require a rule-based reading program, as many struggling readers do, this intervention requires one teacher and no more than one to two students. Otherwise, it doesn't work. If you are a single teacher in a classroom, you can't possibly provide this service, and the result is that a child who needs this kind of program and doesn't get it does not learn how to read. The children who reach high school and are reading at a second or third grade level, it is because they didn't get the services and support they needed when they were young. Insufficient services lead to more and more of our children entering the school to prison pipeline, and that is not acceptable. The purpose of an IEP is to provide access to students to education. Without adequate support and services, there is no access. The current fight in Boston over what model we should have for inclusion is all about resources. We know what works. We have the Henderson, 
most of the Haley School, the Manning, the Mary Lyons, all of whom have two teachers in every classroom, a model that allows students with a wide range of abilities to get their needs met. As teachers, we need the expertise of the professional staff who service our students, the speech and language therapists, the occupational therapists, the school psychologists, et cetera. A student whose IEP says they need speech services might, for example, receive it for 30 minutes once or twice a week. This student is unlikely to make significant improvement unless the speech and language professional has the time in her his schedule to consult with the classroom teacher and advise them how to embed the strategies they are using into the everyday life of the classroom. But in Boston, these professionals typically work at a bunch of schools and their caseloads are determined by IEP minutes. They have no time to talk to teachers and our students are being shortchanged. Under the federal law, families have a right to review the testing re report of their child and have a separate conversation before the IEP meeting to help them understand what is being proposed. Rarely does this happen because the special ed staff who administer the testing and are writing the reports are overwhelmed. I work with ACOSIS, a coordinator of special education, who this past month, this past month ran 61 IEP meetings at four different schools and wrote 52 reports. Her knowledge and expertise about serving children with special needs are not able to be used in meeting, meetings with families or with teachers. Her job is solely to hold meetings and crank out reports. In conclusion, I urge you to reject any proposal that says that the status quo is fine. It is not. Parents of children with special needs who have resources move out of Boston. From Charlestown to Mattapan, from Roxbury to East Boston, the needs of our most vulnerable children are not being met. Let this be the time when we join together and say that all students and families in Boston deserve and need to have what students in Brookline, Newton, and Needham count on. Schools that prepare them with 21st century skills and su can support the growth and healthy development of every child they serve. Finally, I want to say that I am a proud BTU member. As you likely know, we are in contract negotiations and the top priority we are strongly advocating for is inclusion um, done right. Um, so that the IEPs which are written actually provide access and opportunities for our most vulnerable students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Barbara and then following Barbara is Ruby Reyes and then Lisa Ranga. Hi, my name is Barbara DeVico, and I have a daughter who is eight years old and has been Boston Public School since she has turned three when she aged out of early intervention. And there's not a lot I can say from parents that I have heard speaking earlier because I can relate to those parents that came in and have three and four year olds that are trying to get services and being told they just need to come into the programs and see where they'll go. And then I listen to other parents say, I have a daughter that wants to go to the prom. Well, guess what? So doesn't my daughter. And that's not an opportunity of where she is. Boston doesn't offer those opportunities in their sub-separate settings. They don't offer it in their particular classroom styles. I've been in Boston Public Schools as an employee for the last 19 years. I have now had a child in the program for five years, so I'm on both sides of that line. Am I a mom or am I a teacher? It's a very fine line to walk. It's a very difficult line to walk. When I step over a threshold, am I mom today in this meeting or am I gonna be the educator? I have looked at a number of schools. I have been in two schools in 17 years. My daughter's been in Boston Public Schools for five years and she's on her third school. She doesn't fit. She doesn't fit in your schools. She doesn't fit in your programs. I did find schools that she did fit into that were within Boston Public School settings. They're a three year wait. But to get into that three-year wait, her IEP needs to be particular. This needs to be required. This needs to be required. I fully understand the law needs to be made, 
but why aren't those settings that are in those school systems in a lot more? I heard three schools today that were Henderson, Burke, and the Lions. How many more Boston Public Schools can't be like that? Why can't we have children be able to go to a prom and not have to worry about bars on the windows, going through a metal detector? These schools don't have that. They're full inclusion everywhere. I went to one school and had a tour, and I had the tour person say to me, wouldn't it be nice to go to a football game on a Friday night and your daughter be a cheerleader? It would be nice, but she's eight right now, so when she comes out at 22, maybe she will be a cheerleader, but she doesn't have that opportunity to do this because there's no space, there's no room. I'm on a list, I have to wait. You're two minutes from neighborhood places that offer these things, but yet my daughter's on a bus for an hour and a half in the afternoon trying to come home because that's where her IEP reads she fits. But that's not where she fits for my family. I work with the education teachers. I work with the people that are doing all these IEP meetings. I now coordinate afternoon ABA, outside spot, outside therapies, outside horseback riding. I, I do all of that because it's not available in every school. I understand it's not available in every school, but the ones that do have it, why isn't the opportunity given to anyone and not be kept back that that doesn't fit, it doesn't work. What doesn't work? What are the guidelines to get there? Is it money? Is it the system? I've been in three schools. Great experiences, all three schools, they have done everything in their power with their budget, their staff, and their knowledge to give my daughter exactly what she needs. But the system doesn't work. Something needs to be looked at because I can see myself at 20 saying, why doesn't my daughter have an opportunity to go to a prom? Why can't she? Some people have known my daughter since she's three. They're sitting in the audience. My daughter came into school not speaking. I was interrupted, excuse me, with sign language and words and asked for help. I said to Zach, Zach, remember Maya? She couldn't speak when you met her five years ago, huh? He hadn't seen her in a few years. We had a whole conversation and she used a communication device and had a conversation with Zach. And I said, Zach, what do you think about inclusion? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? You met Maya at three. She came in biting people. She came in doing this. She came in doing that. You know what? Let's look at the opportunities of where we are. With your help, and I thank you, we are where we are. We're getting there. We're not where we should be, but we're getting where we need to be for any child, anybody in the Boston Public Schools. I do look at it that the 22 children in my classroom, they're my kids. That's how I treat them. I hope that any classroom my daughter goes in, they treat her the same way, that it's their child. But I do have to say, and thank you to the staff of the advocates, to the coordinators, to the BPS people in the um, bowling building. I thank you. Many of you may know my name. You may know who I am. I may not have met you. I may have spoken to you on the phone. Honestly, there's a lot of people that I've talked to, but I don't know who you are. I may not have talked to you, but I'm not going anywhere. My daughter can't speak in this box of crayon. She's the yellow one that's upside down because that's her color. She's a crayon, but she doesn't fit inside your box. So you need to help me find the box that she's gonna be able to fit into. Because today is Autism Awareness Day, but I have Autism Awareness 365 days, and it's not gonna go away. It's not going away. It's getting more complicated. And it's not just autism, it's this that goes with it and that that goes with it. But your IEP, there wasn't even enough lines for me to write down what I needed to. It's not there. I don't even have the opportunity to tell you who my daughter is, because it's not even on your papers. So if you're representing us, and I would love to move, I would love to move out of Boston, but you know why I don't move? Because I need Boston Children's Hospital to be 15 minutes from my house, because my daughter does stop breathing. She does die, but she gets brought back. That's why I don't leave because that's why I can't move, leave and move out of Boston, because I need the hospital. And I was, have been in BPS for a very long time as a graduate of Boston Public Schools. Let me try it with my daughter. I need your help. There's a lot more people that I've talked to that couldn't be here tonight that need your help. I've been doing it since she's turned three. She's going to be nine in less than two months. 
I'm going to be here till she's 22, so I'm probably going to see people again in the future. Again, my name is Barbara, and I thank you for what you do on behalf thank of you, my daughter and any other daughter or son that can't be here. Thank, thank you thank very you. much, Barbara. <laughs> Welcome, Ruby. Ruby, and then we'll go to Lisa. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Ruby Reyes. I'm the director of the Boston Education Justice Alliance, but I'm here to talk on behalf of Noemi Rodriguez, who's a mother of three children in East Boston. Um, she's also a Spanish speaker, and so <clears throat> she's had to navigate the system in, in Spanish um, as her primary language and has also had to do many of the ferocious uh, activism on behalf of her children, but in a different language. And so um, she asked me to speak on her behalf because she needed to leave. She has three children, uh, three with IEPs, one for epilepsy, one for hyperactive uh, hyperactivity, and then the other one is a slow reader. So um, she has her child who is at the Edison for hyperactivity and her child at the Edison in Brighton. Um, he currently, it took a year for them to diagnose him through the IEP process, and then it took a year to get services for a school psychologist for her child. She's been meeting with the school psychologist individually with the child and has learned how to help manage his hyperactivity um, and learned different tools and um, different techniques from the psychologist. Um, but because of the budget cuts this year, they've slowly cut his time, um, the school psychologist, and in that way he can't afford to continue working for the district. And so she will be losing that school psychologist at the Edison. Um, and that's one of the ways that budget shrinking affects these services is that staff that provide these critical roles are having their, um, their time cut in terms of them traveling to these different schools and offering, offering these services. Um, her other son is, um, he has a smaller IEP with less severe needs, and um, he goes to a school where he is able to have a variety of different activities like arts and taekwondo, and, um, and it's helped him a lot in terms of using different parts of his brain and being able to express his ideas and his feelings. And, um, and a lot of those services are also being cut in BPS just generally. And so I also want to call attention to even though um, special education services are, are shrinking, there's also the reality that all the other services that children in these schools are able to really be able to use, such as the arts, such as um, physical activities that help um, their development and their growth are also being cut through other areas of the budget. Um, so her other child goes to school uh, at the Otis in East Boston. She asked me to talk particularly about parents who have uh, special education children that live in East Boston and are being having their children shipped to other parts of the city that are really far. So because one of her children goes to East Boston, it lives in East Boston and goes to school in Brighton, she has to travel significantly um, through two trains and a bus to get to uh, special education meetings. And even if there is an issue, she's not able to get to the school quickly. And, um, and it, it, you know, in Boston, it doesn't really matter whether you have a car. Um, some places are inaccessible. Uh, and East Boston in particular is an area that is kind of on its own. And those, um, so she asked particular that different special education services be looked at in terms of where the child lives in order to make it accessible for a family to be able to respond to the needs of their child quickly. So if she lives in East Boston, she's able to get to her child's school who goes to the Otis if there's like a behavioral need or if there's a medical need, but she's not able to do that in Brighton. And she's also not able to travel to three different schools to attend different parent meetings or IEP meetings. Um, the other thing that she said was that um, she, uh, she just expressed a lot of frustration with the IEP process. Um, she suggested that a bus monitor be included in all IEP processes um, just to make things easier for most families, 
most families don't realize that you can request a bus monitor in your IEP to help your child um, as they travel back and forth. And it would actually help ease the budget in the sense that if there was a bus monitor dedicated to each bus route, it would alleviate some of that IEP process of having to request an individual specifically for a specific child. But right now that doesn't necessarily happen. And so um, advocating for a bus monitor to be in the bus is not only a safety issue, for the driver in the sense that it helps to support the driver um, who's unable to, to drive and provide security, uh, but also helps the needs of the children because a lot of times the bus routes will have different age children and so you'll have like a five-year-old or a seven-year-old and sometimes the violence that happens with bullying and whatnot um, can be easily mitigated with a monitor but not with a driver. And um, finally, um, it's, you know, it's particularly frustrating and hard to have a child with special needs um, and, you know, the lack of resources or having to figure out how to get resources is also particularly frustrating. It's not easy being able to navigate these systems or not being offered these systems from the beginning that most parents have to figure it out through other parents. Um, and being able to realize what they can and can't advocate for is also particularly frustrating, um, that these things aren't just expressed in very uh, layman's terms for families. Um, and to have a psychologist who's been supporting her child for a year now and been really helpful in not only helping her child from one year to the next, but also helping her and her family to kind of navigate his special needs at home, um, to have that person taken away because of school budget cuts is even more infuriating. So there's frustration at all levels, um, which you know in turn affects a family structure, but also affects a relationship with the school system. So thank you. Thank you, Ruby. Lisa. <laughs> and then following Lisa, I have Bridget, Brendan, and Catherine Brewer. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lisa Ranga, and I am a first grade teacher at the Blackstone School. Um, thank you for giving me the time to testify. It's very refreshing to know that there are people that care what we have to say, and so it's really nice to have uh, a place to say my truth. I want to also thank all of the parents that testified tonight. Um, they, hum I'm humbled by their stories, and a lot of them mentioned that they have maybe the information or the time to figure out what students need, and I'm here, and I hope I do it justice, to help families that actually don't have that information or may not know what they have access to and, and speak on their behalf as a teacher. Um, the slogan for BPS is focus on children, and I really wish that was true. Um, the, the slogan could be, you know, <laughs> focus on power or focus on, you know, uh, keeping comfortable chairs for in the, the bowling building or, I don't know, seats on a school committee. But right now, it doesn't feel like it's focused on children, and it's incredibly frustrating. At the Blackstone this year, our budget was eviscerated. We lost $400,000, and the first thing to go was special education teachers. We lost half. Some people may be shocked, and they should be. I should be shocked, but sometimes I'm barely surprised. Um, my school also has an inclusion program. And I actually, before I came to Boston, I taught in New York and I taught an inclusion program with two full-time teachers. And it was an amazing experience. We had students with disabilities and they had the opportunity to learn with and from their peers. Both the students on IEPs and the general education students benefited from having two teachers and having um, the services provided in the classroom. Students weren't, didn't have to leave the classroom to get their services. It was amazing. And you know, in Boston we have, or at least in my school I should say, I know there are some schools that have two teachers, um, my school has a teacher and a para, and the para is a phenomenal resource. We are lucky and grateful for them, but unfortunately it's just not enough. And you guys have mentioned that before, so I really appreciate that. Um, the intention of inclusion is really wonderful. I just wish we had the implementation. Um, my school also has students with multiple disabilities who I've seen wait months to get what they need. Things that are on their IEP or on a 504 plan, appropriate transportation, one-to-one -one paraprofessionals. And these are things that they should have by law. 
Um, when we got started, uh, someone mentioned that Massachusetts was on the forefront of special education law, and that's absolutely true and something I think we should be proud of. But I think that the state of Massachusetts was on the forefront of writing the law, and we have to make sure that we're on the forefront of upholding the law as well. And unfortunately, throughout the state, upholding that law can look different, depending on where you live or perhaps how connected you are. And our neediest students in Boston, they need us. <laughs> Plainly. So I'm here to advocate for two-teacher inclusion and making sure that students get everything on their IEP when they're supposed to get it. I understand that things can't happen right away. It's a huge district with a lot of students, but waiting months and months to get evaluated or waiting months and months to get what's on a 504 plan or an IEP just isn't acceptable. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Bridget, Bridget uh, Grogan, Brendan Brooks. Catherine Brewer, come on up. And then on deck, I have Stephanie Musto and Edith Bazzilli. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak tonight. It's not often that as a parent in the BPS system, I feel heard, so thank you. And I appreciate everyone who is here today to listen. Uh, I am the parent, my name is Catherine Brewer, I'm a Jamaica Plain resident and a proud parent of two kids, um, both teens in different high schools in BPS. Both are diagnosed with high cognitive autism, um, which um, seems to be a real challenge uh, for this particular school system. My kids look fine, but they're not fine. That's why they have IEPs. And we continually experience professionals ignoring their IEPs because they don't see an issue. When an issue occurs, they, get, they blame my children or my family. Oh, it's just a family issue instead of looking at the reams of documentation we have provided. I moved here and moved my family here because this is Boston. We are Boston. <laughs> this is not okay. This is Autism Awareness Day. <sighs> we don't blame children for their disabilities. We don't blame their families for their disabilities. We don't decide outside of IEP team processes that your child doesn't need it. It's not okay, this is Boston. This is why we came. I have since left working for a quasi part of City of Boston because I full time support my kids um, because they don't get the services that they need even with their IEPs. Most recent, uh, well, one kid in exam school, he went for four years through the process, no one paying him any attention, most times no SPED teacher even in the room. He played video games with his allotted IEP's bedtime. We have an advocate, we speak out, we're educated, we do all of this, we fight, we fight, we fight, and we finally moved from that 14 through 17 bracket that are kids that'll go on a trajectory. The same people who wouldn't service my son, now all of a sudden, like why can't he get through the college application process? Why can't he do this? Why can't he do that? They're calling me now. They're finally wanting to communicate. Now he's in a fifth year, which I'm very grateful for and I'm very happy about, but he's still tied to the school that never provided him services in the first place. My other son started at that school. We have since then moved him and we were very hopeful and we were very excited about his new school, which is helping in a lot of ways. But even at this school, they even documented in his progress reports we don't see any issues, so we're not providing these services. I mean, come on, they're in an IEP. You don't wait and see. What does wait and see look like for my kid? It can mean a trip to the emergency room because he is like another parent's child that spoke, he's an internalizer. He brings it all home and we deal with it. I can't stop shaking sometimes when I have to ask my kid to do something because I'm like, is this the day he's gonna throw something at me? Because he brings all the stress home. I don't work anymore. I was the primary caregiver, I mean, the primary breadwinner. 
it is, but Boston's expensive. <laughs> the, the stress on our family is tremendous, and I still am the one working with those kids more than the services at school. My second um, child also is um, trans, and I recently found out at a doctor's office visit for something completely different that the headaches that he's been experiencing were from dehydration. And again, we have an ASD kid who looks fine, but I want to stress, autism is invisible. You don't see it. It's how your brain is wired. So when providers make decisions because they don't see anything, how do they see an invisible disability? You see it because we bring you paperwork. You see it because of this. You don't not give a kid insulin because you don't see their diabetes. This is what my child needs. So recently, this kid with ASD and an additional social anxiety disorder, as well as having gender identity issues, we learned was dehydrated and had chosen not to intake water during the day because he couldn't figure out how to get to the bathrooms at school. So his only choice from his perspective was to take on the problem himself. So he stopped drinking water or any kind of liquid. This is what happens to the kids when we don't follow IEPs. It shouldn't fall on the kids to internalize the issues. It shouldn't fall on kids to not go to college because they can't figure out how to do the basic life skills that their IEPs were supposed to help them with. And they don't need to be blamed by BPS staff for it. They don't need to be told, well, you should have done something when the very nature of their disability is in languaging, social pragmatics, metalinguistics, executive functioning. That's what their IEPs are to help them for. So in closing, I'd just like to ask and remind, I am more than willing and wanting to partner, but I have to have someone to partner with. There has to be someone listening and willing to work with me on the other side. These are great professionals. They are definitely over, you know, it's, they've got too much to do, but they're also really untrained. Pull together parents, ask parents to come into the schools, talk to the teachers, talk. I mean, there's a great resource here and we'd love to, to help in some way. It's a very powerless feeling to feel like this is all happening to my kid at school and I can't do anything about it. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Stephanie and then Edith. Sorry, what? Stephanie and then Edith. Okay. Stephanie. No, oh, just come on Bridget. up. So, um, my name is Bridget Grogan. I thought I was on the. Oh, Bridget, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're back there. Um, Welcome. <laughs> so, my name is Bridget Grogan. I'm um, a teacher at the Mario Mana Academy in East Boston. Um, and uh, about seven weeks ago, we were able to have a, um, a meeting between our uh, Umana Academy staff, um, BTU representatives, and Assistant Superintendent Zayas in Lombardi. Um, and in preparation for that meeting, the Umana building rep sent out a survey to all staff to assess their concerns um, and have been continuously collecting incidents as they occur um, in regards to many different things, but many of them are in regards to special education and IEPs. Um, these are firsthand accounts from teachers and paraprofessionals um, who were involved, and they were compiled and given to the assistant superintendents and our BTU field reps during that meeting. Um, many of these accounts were extremely concerning when it uh, in regards to special education and IEPs. Um, several staff members reported being approached by the special education coordinator in a hostile and accusatory manner just after submitting a written request from a parent to evaluate their child. During the referral process, a special education coordinator and administrative team at the Umana regularly and aggressively attacked teaching practices, accused teachers of being lazy and not wanting to, quote, deal with students who struggle and of not having proper special education training. Um, parent requests tend to disappear once handed in to the coordinator or administrative team. Many times these individuals 
on the um, special ed and, and um, administrative teams call parents and students to school to scare them out of having their child evaluated. They tell parents that teachers want their students out of their rooms, in some cases in front of the student, and if they continue with the evaluation, their child will never be admitted to college. This causes significant challenges in relationships between teachers and parents, as well as teachers and students. Um, I have brought a collection of special education accounts from the Omana, um, and I would like to read a couple excerpts. Um, I would like to remind you that these have been, in addition to many others, they have been given to um, the, super, the assistant superintendents who attended that meeting. Um, they receive a similar packet, and no interventions have been made to our current special education practices and in-house policies, and the seeming inaction on the part of the district is in itself highly problematic. Um, the first one is, um, during, um, during the week of February 4th, a parent sent a written request to have her son evaluated for special education services. Later that week, the special education coordinator approached this teacher in the copy room with some follow-up questions about the SST referral. With the understanding that th we have 45 days to complete the evaluation, I asked the coordinator for, this teacher asked the coordinator for the timeline for next steps. The coordinator responded by asking my knowledge about certain special education laws, where I got my special education license, and what coursework I had completed. They then said that I could listen to rumors or trust her and the process without giving any information about the timeline that this teacher asked about. Um, on uh, about a month later, the coordinator approached the same teacher in the copy room to make a comment and made a comment that people don't often know the difference between special education and bad teaching. Um, when the teacher made it clear that she took the comment personally, the coordinator said that she must have misunderstood and uh, misunderstood what she said and apologized. Um, the teacher was notified of an, so I'll read it in the first person because that's how it was written. Um, I was notified of an annual IEP review for one of my students one week before the meeting date. I arrived at the meeting on time. The only person who was there was the resource room teacher and we waited for 30 minutes before leaving. As I walked down the hallways back to the classroom, the special education coordinator yelled my name from the other end of the hallway. She insisted that I return and complete the meeting. I informed her that I had to return to my class because there was no coverage for the next block. I had arranged my own coverage with a paraprofessional in the neighboring <coughs> classroom. Very little coverage is ever provided for classroom teachers to attend their own IEP meeting. Um, Ms. Mahon, uh, sorry, the uh, special education coordinator became irate and became shouting at her, uh, began shouting at me, still from the other end of the hallway, that I was inconsiderate and that everyone is guilty of being late. She accused me of being holier than thou. I, I began walking towards her and told her we would have to reschedule the meeting. She mumbled something under her breath and walked into her office away from me. I returned to my class. And later that day, I followed up with the occupational therapist whose name was on the list to attend the IEP review. She explained that she had contacted the coordinator the week before to remind her that she, the OT, was not going to be able to attend the meeting because she was assigned to work at another school. The afternoon the IEP meeting was scheduled, the coordinator approached the OT and asked for an update on the student. Then, the coordinator asked the OT to sign a paper to show that they had discussed the child. The resource room teacher was also approached in this manner and asked to sign the paper. The, the special ed coordinator approached me the next day and asked for an update on the student. I gave her a verbal update. <laughs> but refused to sign the paper when I saw it was an official sign-in sheet that is customary to sign when all members of the IEP are assembled together at an official IEP meeting. The coordinator became upset, accused me of being difficult, and said how much work it would be to reschedule everyone for another meeting. I walked away. I never received any notification of rescheduling this meeting, and when I reached out to the parent, they claimed that they had no awareness that an annual review meeting was scheduled to take place. I later learned that this is a violation of special education law. Um, and this is the last one, I promise. <laughs> After very little reading progress, I developed concerns about a student in my class. I completed several interventions and collected data, but given that SST has been a very difficult process in the past, I completed a two-page student profile containing every piece of information and every piece of data I knew about the student in hopes that this information would inform 
SST team and paint a clear picture of the concerns about the student. I was invited to attend SST two months after I submitted a request. When I was notified that I was on the schedule to meet with SST, I inquired about coverage since I was scheduled to teach students during SST time. I never got a response and asked a college who, a college, a colleague who had PND during that block to cover my class so I could attend. During the meeting, I brought copies of the student profile to share with each SST member and reviewed the information. Our principal entered the meeting five minutes before we were scheduled to end. I filled her in on the student and my concerns. When she saw that the child's ELD level was a three, she began shouting at me saying that there's an overrepresentation of, of English language learners on IEPs and that parents are being, quote, tricked into testing and that parents in our community don't fully understand what it means to have their child evaluated. She said that I needed to complete more interventions, check back after middle of the year benchmark testing. I did as she instructed, and when the child made no reading growth, I submitted another request to meet with SST. Six weeks later, I was invited back to SST, again having to find my own coverage, and again brought updated copies of the student profile to share with the team. The principal and the special ed coordinator both insulted my choice in intervention, told me I wasn't doing enough during our start time, which is supposed to be reading intervention, but is largely unstructured time. Um, and I informed them that I had been trained in that specific, specific intervention during my master's coursework. I also reminded them that I had used the intervention with other students who had showed progress. I was told that the student was, quote, not eligible for evaluation because of her ELD level. And I was told that I was, quote, insensitive to the needs of the community for referring a child for evaluation. I left the meeting in tears and felt so discouraged that I did not recommend the student to SST again. I did collect the student's work samples and year-long data to give to the student's teacher, teacher the following year. The student's new teacher also had concerns and discussed the student with the SST team. The student's mother was very involved in her, student's in her daughter's education, and she and I stayed in frequent contact. The mother also shared her concerns for her daughter's reading struggles and lack of progress. To my knowledge, her parent was never notified by the SST team that her child had been discussed, and the child, now in middle school at the Umana, has never completed um, an evaluation. Thank you, and you're gonna share those packets with us, yes. or that packet with us. Thank you for being here. Is Brendan here? Brendan? Um, okay, I will try and be quick. I know we're getting a little late here. Uh, my name is Brendan Brooks. I'm also a teacher at the Umana. I teach middle school ESL. Um, in what is, what's called a full inclusion setting. Um, my angle on this is a little bit different in that um, what I want to say is sort of moving towards a solution. Um, so this is what I wrote. Before I came home to Boston and began, began teaching in BPS, for two years I taught at a large New York City high school in Queens. At John Adams High School, the class size limit, even for a room made up entirely of new immigrants, all beginners in the English language, was 28 students. I was elated, and indeed proud of my city, to learn when I came back to Boston last year that for English learners and their teachers in BPS, the class size limit was 20 students. There's a reason for that. It doesn't take an expert to understand that when fewer kids are in the room, teachers can pay more attention to each and every one of them. Teachers, that is to say, can teach more. Students, as a result, will learn more. They feel more cared for, less distracted by peers, more comfortable with their surroundings, and closer with their classmates and teachers. It is then sound policy that BPS holds such small class limits relative to other large urban districts. Forgoing the reality that too often administrators are left with little choice but to ignore class limits and accept grievances from teachers with overcrowded rooms. The bigger question is this. Why does BPS's commendable policy on class size limit not seem to apply when it comes to special education? At the Umana in East Boston, it's been a tough year. 
Last year's MCAS, is, MCAS scores fell significantly from the previous year, and from a level one school, we have become a level three. If our scores don't improve this year, we've been told, we'll fall under turnaround status. Consequently, tension and stress among staff this year has increased dramatically, trust has decreased dramatically. Teachers are left to find solutions. Most suggestions we hear about at professional development sessions or in-school trainings involve new methods for classroom instruction, new strategies for managing behavior, new approaches to analyzing data. And these are important areas of the job where we could definitely improve, like most places. But bad teaching is not the problem. Outdated curricula, old school methods of instruction are not the problem. The problem is our inability to appropriately, fairly, and equitably serve our students with special needs. For students with emotional disabilities or other psychological trauma, the district employs at the Umana two guidance counselors for more than 1,000 students. Our school of over 1,000 students has one occupational therapist, one special education coordinator who has zero support staff. At the middle school level for nearly 500 students, our school has only five full-time special education teachers. Somebody earlier mentioned the suburbs. I grew up in Wellesley. At Wellesley Middle School, there are roughly 100 students with IEPs. Welcome to the Boston City Council's Ionella Chamber for a hearing in the City Council's Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation on docket number 1327, order for a hearing regarding Boston speed limits and pedestrian safety. My name is Michelle Wu and I'm chair of this committee. I'm joined by my colleagues and the sponsors of this hearing order, District Councilor Ed Flynn and District Councilor Frank Baker. I want to remind everyone that this public hearing is being recorded and broadcast live on channels Comcast 8, RCN 82, and Verizon 1964, as well as streaming on the City of Boston website. Uh, please silence your cell phones and other devices, and if you wish to testify, uh, please check the box on the sign-in sheets, check the appropriate sheet on, on the sheets by the door, and um, we will then take public testimony. Okay. so. Again, I want to thank our sponsors for, for continuing to follow this issue. Uh, thanks in particular to Councilor Baker's leadership over the last term. Boston now has a uh, lower default speed limit, and we have much more work to do, but um, he's just been a, a committed advocate on this issue and um, so many of the issues that are related to neighborhood safety and, and, and street safety. So I want to give each of the sponsors a chance to And I also want to say thank you to Councilor Baker for working closely with the Walsh administration to um, help reduce the speed limit, but more importantly to help reduce um, injuries, fatalities that we have in our, in our city. It's because of your leadership that we're making great progress. Um, I believe pedestrian safety is the top issue in my district and one of the most important in our city. <coughs> safety for all on our roads, for pedestrians, motorists, cyclists, vision zero, no fatal or serious crashes in Boston. Again, I'd also like to highlight the work of Mayor Walsh, his leadership in moving our city forward through various traffic calming measures, one of which, one of which was lowering the speed limit to 25 miles per hour last January. Despite this significant progress, hardly a day goes by when my friends, neighbors. In Boston's public schools when it comes to special education. Make no mistake, the problem is dire. As the district and its schools consider solutions, I'd advocate for a very simple one. 
hire more special educators tomorrow. It's what Boston schools need, it's what our students and families deserve, and it's the right thing to do. I also just wanna say quickly, even though the two assistant superintendents for special education have left the room, I don't think, I'd like to think that this is not their fault. I have to think that special educators at that kind of level would like more funding. Why we don't have it is what's not clear. Um, but it's obvious, I think, to everyone, whether we're talking about ABA, whether we're talking about inclusion, whether we're talking about L's with special needs, we need more money and we need more teachers. That's the bottom line. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. And just um, so people know, we're getting to the last four for public testimony. So I know a few of you are trying to um, get out, but just for the right timing. Uh, Stephanie and then Edith. Is Stephanie here? Go ahead, Edith. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Edith Pazil, and I'm the president of the Black Educators Alliance of Massachusetts. I want to thank you so much for having this hearing. And this is an urgent matter, as evidenced by us going into our fourth hour of the hearing. So thank you so much for having this. I want to say that the special education community is not an accidental community. Those who go into this field go in because of their deep passion, dedication, and commitment to doing the work. I've worked with many special education teachers, and I applaud the fact that they do so much with so little and work such long hours. So I think we need to give credit to our special education teachers who are at the forefront of doing this work. Unfortunately, as we've heard this evening, Special education in Boston, however, is broken, and many of our teachers' hands are tied. Today, I wanna to talk about how special education impacts our students of color, and the system where our students of color are overrepresented in what we call the high incidence problematic categories. This is a problem that we need to understand, but more important than that, it's a challenge that must be addressed with courageous solutions. And there are no safe spaces in special education as attested by all of the profound stories from pa parents, teachers, and educators. But I think we need to create courageous spaces where we can come up with some real solutions to some of these intractable problems. Special education for students of color has had a very long and troubling history. I've worked in special education as a teacher and administrator for over 30 years, and we know that students who come from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds are incorrectly labeled in certain problematic high incidence categories. So I'd like to share some of the data. I think what's more troubling than that is that when we look at the academic outcomes, they are poor. And so, in the interest of time, I'd just like to focus on the disparities that we see among black males in special education. In June of 2016, the special ed department shared data at the school committee on the status of special education in Boston, and I'm sure this has not changed. In the category of communication impairment, which is a high incidence category, Black males are labeled twice the rate when compared to their white male peers. Black males are labeled um, four times the rate when compared to white male peers in the category of intellectual impairment. And black males are labeled, again, twice the rate when compared with their white male peers in specific learning disabilities. But then when we look at emotional impairment, that's the category where some uh, parent, uh, parent talked about the McKinley School, that's one area. Black males are labeled five times more than their white male peers. Emotional impairment is a category that drives placements in what we call behavioral settings in Boston, such as lab classes and lab clusters. Also, Boston Public Schools has four, four McKinley schools, which houses students with the label of emotional impairment. Four separate buildings where students have 
absolutely no interaction with their general education peers. Now, it is unclear whether the data that BPS presented included those students because the McKinley schools are considered public-private, and in their data, they disaggregated the students who are in private placements. So perhaps that five times greater than their white male peers is a higher figure if we look at that. I believe that that's a question that needs to be explored, particularly given the quite graphic descriptions that were provided by the previous parent, which I know to be quite accurate. The segregation of black males in special education is nothing new, however. Sadly, in Boston, special education becomes a place where black males are warehoused. And some of the research uh, from Beth Harry, who worked in the Office of Civil Rights, as well as other research, inform us of the factors that contribute to overrepresentation of African American males in special education. I'd like to just cite briefly a few. First, teachers who do not believe that black males can achieve academic success may ignore, then isolate them when academic difficulties occur. This can lead to students feeling frustrated and alienated. Instead of providing support to black males, the deficit thinking may lead them to interpret learning challenges as behavioral, especially if students complain or act out when they don't get the help that they need. Second, when teachers have not had high quality professional development in providing evidence-based instructional and behavioral strategies as an integral part of daily routine instruction to effectively address learning challenges in the content areas, it drives the perception that special education is the only game in town. Third, school staffs who perceive black males as aggressive or dangerous may engage in criminalizing their behavior, which is why black males are suspended three times higher than their peers. This often leads to special education referrals. Fourth, the increasing numbers of white teachers in Boston creates conditions for cultural discontinuities, widening the teacher diversity gap or the black-white teacher gap, which we know from the John Hopkins University study. When teachers are not appropriately prepared to engage students from different cultural backgrounds, misclassification of culturally and linguistically diverse students occur. Now, when we look at the overall placement rate of special education in Boston, the district currently uh, classifies over 20% of its students in a special education category, which is one of the highest rates in the country. The average is 13%. But if we look at similarly situated urban districts, it can range between 9 and 11%. Boston was at 22%, which was its highest in 1998. Uh, the district went down to about 70, 17%, and now it's going back up. There is a serious problem there. Although Boston Public Schools is increasing its inclusion classes, if teachers do not receive high quality professional development, particularly in the area of evidence-based intensive reading interventions, students still don't get the support they need. And I think that that was um, something that was talked about previously. According to Louisa Mose, who is a premier reading specialist in the country, reading failure is one of the most frequent underlying causes of special education referrals in the high incidence categories. And so we, we know that the professional development in, in BPS is lacking, and that's a real problem. Um, further, just as IDEA does not define special education as a place, inclusion is, not, is also not a place. If teachers are not getting the professional development support so that they can use strategies and have resources, and if classes are not appropriately staffed, then we're going to see continual, continual failure in the outcomes for students learning. And one only needs to look at the achievement outcomes of students in these placements to see that the achievement is not impressive, it's not happening, it's just not positive. In sum, misclassification is a misappropriation of educational services. It does not meet the needs of those who are misclassified, and instead, it does harm. 
special education has resulted in the resegregation of black males and fuels the school to prison pipeline, but also the school to graveyard pipelines. It's time to change these trends that are devastating the lives of black and brown students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Edith. Uh, next we have, is Stephanie here? Hi, yes, Stephanie, I'm welcome. Stephanie Musto. And then we have Aaliyah and then Jacqueline to wrap us up. Thank you so much for giving um, all the teachers um, and parents here a voice. I know that this has been a frustration and a struggle for many, many years for many of us. Um, and thank you for being here so late as well. So um, at the end of last year, uh, sorry, I work at the Mario Umana K-8 Academy, uh, where over 80% of our students are English language learners. So what I'm gonna speak about today um, has to do with our referral process and the fact that students are being denied uh, evaluations and being denied services um, despite written requests by parents and verbal requests by teachers. So at the end of last school year, uh, our school filed a complaint with the, with the Department of Education for improper SST practices, um, the conclusion of which has not been shared with the staff. I was cornered by my principal uh, for being involved with this complaint, and she claimed that this lawsuit, she kept using those words, uh, was uh, invalid because our air t our practices at the Umana were quote airtight. So I'm here to talk about some of those airtight practices. I began my um, career at the Umana as an inclusion teacher, so I can speak to some of those experiences uh, as well. I grew concerned about a student in my homeroom class who was making very little reading progress. Uh, he was a focused and hardworking student, so it stood out that he wasn't making progress. Um, after preparing a report to share with the SST team, I was not invited to attend SST until three months after my request. The team told me that because his ELD level was a four, he was not eligible for evaluation because he needed, quote, more time to learn the language. I met with the student's father as well to share concerns. His father was also concerned with the amount of effort uh, the student was exhibiting at home and the lack of uh, progress being made at school, at which time he signed um, a request to evaluate his son. Um, the request was placed in the special education coordinator's mailbox um, and I was never contacted again about this uh, request or about presenting more information at SST. The school guidance counselor was uh, cornered by the uh, special education co coordinator and accused of, quote, going around the system. And ultimately what ended up happening is the father um, was not responding to any of my requests to communicate with him or to follow up and he um, shared with another staff member that he was called for a meeting after school hours and was told by our administrative team and by the special education coordinator that if his son was actually evaluated, he would never get into college, at which uh, he believed that information and um, cut off all communication with me because he felt like I was um, doing a disservice to his son. Um, on another occasion, there was a student who um, I had for two years. I began as a second grade teacher and looped to third grade, so I had had experience with this student over two years. Was very concerned with her lack of progress as well. Again, um, compiled a two-page report with lots of information about this student, presented it to SST. I was told to, quote, work one-on-one -on -one with the student. I did not have um, a para at the time or a way to make that happen, unfortunately. Um, and that the student needed, quote, more time to make progress. So I met with the student's mother, um, much like the first story I just shared, who was also frustrated for hearing these um, teacher frustrations year after year and being concerned for her daughter. She also signed a request to evaluate. Um, the, evaluate the request was put in the special coordinator's mailbox, um, never heard from or followed up with again on that matter. I requested to go back to SST to present on this student later in the year, again after um, continuously making no progress, and um, uh, was told pretty much the same thing. And this, um, this parent continued to just be incredibly frustrated and sad for her daughter not receiving any additional services or testing. So 
the following year, I was in touch with the, with the child's teacher and she reached out to the doctor. So it came, eventually came to light through other testing that this child was suffering from micro seizures. Um, this child is still a student at the Uman in the middle school and to this day does not have an IEP or a 504 plan. Um, the, the last um, story that I will share with you also speaks to a parent who requested evaluation and was told that her son would never get into college. That student, unfortunately, was present at the private meeting that the administrative team and the special coordinator requested. So parent and student attended, the teacher was not invited, and this was after the written request was submitted. The student came to school the next day in tears and asked his teachers why they didn't want him in their classroom. And so the teachers had to have that very difficult conversation explaining that that was not the case at all and that they wanted additional support for him. Um, I am unsure at this time whether the testing actually happened, um, but these private meetings continue to happen. And um, we're a K-8 school, but I can speak specifically to the elementary, and we have over 400 students in the general education population, um, and only seven of which receive resource room services. So those numbers alone show that there's a statistic anomaly in the testing that's going on at my school, and students are being denied their right to evaluation. Parents are being taken advantage of because for, for most of them, their primary language is Spanish, and they have come from other countries and they do not know their rights. And they're, be, and they're trusting misinformation coming from um, teachers' superiors. Um, so I want to just leave you with that and thank you for your time. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Aaliyah and then Jacqueline. Hi, my name is Aaliyah Sadbury. I'm from Dorchester. I'm the parent of a six-year-old daughter with autism. Yesterday marked the beginning of Autism Awareness Month and today is Autism Awareness Day. When we look at the increasing incidence of autism, one in 50 students, students of color and their families lose when trying to get services in DPS. I've tried to get a placement in Boston when, when my daughter was three years old, but when I went to observe one class, the teacher was taking a nap with the lights out with her students. The other placements were too chaotic for me to feel safe enough to send my daughter. I want to place my daughter in DPS instead of being forced to do a private placement, which is what she's in now, but I do not have the confidence based on what I've seen and I'm afraid to put my child in a school in Boston. In an effort to help other parents, I began a group called Brown Girls of Autism because trying to find advocacy for parents of color is nearly impossible. Oh, trust me, I know. Um, as a parent, we want our voices to be heard, but we struggle with getting board certi certified ADA services, assistive technology, communication supports, and quality safe placements. Parents who have access to legal and advocacy resources receive technology and other services, but parents of color who cannot afford advocates or attorneys are often denied the same services and supports. Instead, we are given placements that feel like redlining. To create partnership with parents in the city of Boston, parents of color must be respected and have a real voice in the decision-making process because we are the experts about our children's strengths and challenges. Parents should not have to have costly legal representation to get, the BP, to get BPS to do the right thing by our children, but sadly, that is the reality in BPS. With all these issues in BPS, there is not even an independent black parent on the superintendent search committee. This is just another example of how voices of black parents are dismissed and many wonder why we do what we do to get a placement outside of Boston. We are close to 40% of the BPS population. That's unacceptable. Parents of color in Boston want the same thing for their children that all parents want, but when we express our needs, we are treated as if we are asking for too much. We want what's best for our children and we want BPS to provide quality programs and services to us also. And I also wanna talk about what I went through with my own daughter's IEP. So when she was in early intervention, she received um, ABA through the May Institute, I chose them 
with wonderful service. Um, my daughter had very limited language. And when we had the IEP meeting, they offered her 15 minutes of speech three times a month with a consult. And um, she was also lacking in her gross motor skills. And they offered her 30 minutes of OT three times a month with a consult. Um, they also offered her ABA one hour um, a day in group. So what I did was I rejected the placement. I moved her services back home. And she received three hours of ABA five days a week for nine months until the May Institute piloted their center-based program. I placed her in that program. Um, I actually had to do premium assistance to obtain Blue Cross Blue Shield so that those services would be covered in the center-based program because we couldn't do it under Mass Health. Um, when she aged out of the May Institute Center, and not to get it confused with the school because that's different, that's an out-of-district placement, um, I looked into BPS again and they offered the same thing. So I found another center-based program called uh, Beerman ABA, and she is now six years old, and she's there to this day. She's thriving, she's happy. Um, what happened to me in December was that I, um, I lost the premium assistance program, and so she began doing um, Mass Health Primary. Beerman doesn't take Mass Health Primary, so she was kicked out of the program for a month. I again reviewed options for BPS. I wasn't comfortable. I'm, I, I'm hearing all the same things I heard before. I live in a fixed income, and I actually am paying for a Blue Cross Blue Shield premium out of pocket, which takes almost half of my income for the month, just so she can go back to Beerman and receive the services that she's getting. She gets eight hours of ABA a day, and that's with um, math, reading, and you know all the other things they do. She, she's, you know, as I said, she's thriving. She's, she has language. And she's doing very well. She's not high functioning. She's moderately autistic. Um, I don't want to have to pay for private insurance so she can go to this, you know, this program. I want her to go to BPS. I live in Dorchester, but I'm not comfortable because of all of the things that I've heard from even with the parents in my support group, it's all bad. And I, I, I feel for anyone who has a child in the special ed program in BPS. I, I never want that for my daughter. Um, but I, I want to eventually place her in BPS. You know, um, I just hope the program gets better. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Leah. And then uh, last on our list for public testimony, Jacqueline. Welcome, Jacqueline. Thank you very much. It's been, I think, a couple of long hours and a very compelling testimony. Um, my name is Jacqueline Rodriguez, and I'm a bilingual school psychologist. I'm also the parent of uh, three daughters, uh, one who uh, had an IP for speech resource, a phonic year until she was in 11th grade. Um, she had been diagnosed ADD and had conductive hearing loss. She is now in an Ivy League school. And um, the services where she received um, I, you know, all these IP services was not in Boston. I never had to fight for any of the services that she received. Um, I am in Boston, of course. I'm a school psychologist for 18 years now. Uh, I work in two schools, and I, um, I'm sorry, I wasn't here yesterday. I was on my way here, but um, I was, uh, received a text that I had a suicidal student in one of my elementary schools, and so I had to go back. And so uh, it wasn't until about quarter of six that I was able to leave the school, and by then I thought you guys would be done. Um, but, um, so I'm sorry, but I just, I did want to talk a little bit about the crisis work that we do, like the work that I had to do yesterday, last week, uh, a team of about 11 school psychologists responded to 
uh, a tragic event at one of our schools. And um, the folks, you know, under the amazing leadership of Andrea Amador, uh, she pulled our team together like she always does. The school psychologists respond. We provide crisis support for teachers, staff, the, the, the staff, the parents, the students who are traumatized by the event. Um, and in last week's case, uh, um, it was at the, you know, it was just a, a very bad incident of a death of a very beloved uh, staff person. And I must say that, you know, we are, I don't know what numbers you were told um, yesterday uh, exist in our department, but I can tell you that 116, that's the number to remember. That's the number of staff that we need uh, to really be able to support IEPs, to be able to, when, when we have counseling on IEPs, we, we being school psychologists and people adjustment counselors, we are the ones that have to be uh, um, the, the providers for the IEPs because that is what the law is telling us. And so when we have students who require counseling um, and uh, you, you cannot use fee-for-service or our partners um, in the schools, you can't use them to provide the services for those students' IEPs. Um, it, you, you're relying on us. And I can give you an example of m what March looked like for me. Uh, I had 20 IEP meetings. I had um, 15 or so students in counseling to see a week, and I had one crisis. Um, so, you know, it, it's just, I think we try our best. And again, under the amazing leadership of Andrea Amador, we are uh, stretched, we do our best, we, we try to be on top of all the trainings that we need to take, but when you have over 1,100 students and the state average is about 600, one to 600, and we are one, to almost 1,200, some of us, um, and we have really 50 school psychologists to pull from the pool, really, 50. Uh, there, there's, it's so complicated, I can't even explain it, and it's so late. Um, but I, I, I have to say that we try our best. Um, when I train, I will have two interns next year. When we train our interns, the domains that we have to train them in include counseling, uh, consultation with teachers um, and a bunch of other areas, uh, consultation, training to staff. We have to, uh, all these domains, including testing, uh, ha we have to train our interns in doing all those things. And when we say, as we are in contract negotiations right now, we want more mental health staff, parents have been saying that. We've heard that tonight, I'm sure you heard that yesterday. I, what we really want to emphasize is that the, the staff that's hired, if, if any more are to be hired, please let it be licensed staff, guidance counselors, um, uh, social workers, school psychologists, but folks who have license because who can't say they're a counselor? A lot of people, coaches, whatever, can say they're counselors or uh, coaches and provide uh, counseling to students, but the ones that are required ver via IEPs are licensed mental health counselors. And so I just want to remind folks um, that the number that we really are thinking would make sense for our students in Boston is 116. Um, and I want to thank you so much for your patience and for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, and thank you all for being here. Councilor Janey, closing comments. Yes, just very quickly, the hour is late, is now 9 p.m. Um, I, I just want to make uh, one observation, which was that uh, what we just heard in terms of public testimony was very different than what we heard on the panel. Um, and it, you know, it's important for us to try to move to a place where we are all experiencing the same things. And I know that there are folks on the inside of the district who are working very hard, um, but we've got to make sure that all of our children are being um, serviced and that their needs are being met. I want to just give a special uh, thank you to all of the educators uh, in the room, all of the advocates who showed up, and especially to all of the parents uh, who continue to fight
fight for your children every single day. Keep up that fight. Um, while you were here spending four hours with us, you were away from your children. Um, but I certainly appreciate your advocacy and um, that you were so frank and candid uh, in terms of sharing um, what was very you know, heartbreaking in terms of your own stories and your struggles uh, with this system. So thank you uh, for your continued advocacy and your fight and look forward to uh, working together to make the improvements that our children deserve in BPS. Thank you. Thank you and thank you, Madam Chair, for your leadership on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jeannie, for your partnership. Um, I just, I do want to note uh, this evening's hearing is just over, just about four hours long. Um, we had almost three hours of that was public testimony, which is very powerful to me. Um, and in for public testimony, usually when we stretch into this late hour, people start peeling off that had signed up for public testimony. All but one person stayed to offer their testimony. Um, the testimony was um, powerful. I think uh, reminding me and others about the important work that we have as a city to take care of your children, uh, both your children if you're here as a parent, your children if you're here as a classroom teacher, uh, because I see those kids as your children, and um, recognize that um, we have so much work to do in um, making sure that we are caring properly for your kids, and that we're not just meeting the standards, but again, um, I think Catherine said this is Boston, that in Boston I expect that we are exceeding the standard, that we are doing more than just meeting the needs of our kids, uh, that we are going beyond that. I expect that for my own children and the Boston Public Schools, that we are exceeding their needs. I expect them to exceed expectations, and I look forward to um, continued work in this space as we go forward. I will also note, just for the record, that there were some references this evening to contract negotiations. As a city council, we are not involved in contract negotiation. We are not privy to information that is being discussed and negotiated during contract negotiations. We simply uh, may read information that's in the media, uh, but we are not privy and do not participate in conversations regarding contract negotiations. Um, with that said, I will uh, adjourn this meeting and um, wish you all a good night. Thank you.